Okay, looks like it's stabilized. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo, and good morning to everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you to the December 16th, 2022 meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board. It is 9.03 a.m. My name is Jennifer Urban, and I'm the chairperson of the board. Before we get started with the substance of the meeting, as usual, I have some logistical announcements. First, I'd like to ask everyone to please check that your microphone is muted when you are not speaking. Additionally, please note that the meeting is being recorded. Today's meeting will be run according to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as required by law. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by board members. I will also ask for public comment on each agenda item. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. If you wish to speak on an item and you are using the Zoom webinar, please use the raise your hand function in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you wish to speak on an item and you are joining by phone, please press star nine on the phone to show the moderator that you are raising your hand. Our moderator, Mr. Sabo, will call your name when it is your turn and request that you unmute yourself at that time. Those using the webinar can, can use the unmute feature and those dialing in by phone can press star six to unmute. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. It is helpful if you identify yourself, but this is voluntary and you can input a pseudonym when you log into the meeting. We also have a designated time on the agenda for public comment, which is agenda item number nine today. As mentioned as well, the board welcomes public comments on any individual item on the agenda. It is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board voting on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please let us know by using the raise your hand functions and Mr. Sabo will recognize you. Please be aware that each speaker again will be limited to three minutes per agenda item for public comments. Relatedly, I would like to remind everyone of the rules of the road under Bagley Keene. Both board members and members of the public may only discuss items that are on the agenda for today when those items are up for discussion. Items on the agenda that not are not on the agenda can be suggested for discussion at future meetings when the board takes up its agenda item designated for that purpose, which is number 10 today. We will take breaks as needed. Um, we'll take one between 11 a.m. and noon, um, depending on where we are on the agenda, but in there, shorter breaks if needed. And please note as well that the 11th agenda item today is a closed session item. Um, so we have put the rest of the business before that item so the public can choose um, whether or not to stay. When we get to the closed session item, the board will adjourn for closed session. We will keep this Zoom open. And then when we are finished with the closed session item, the board will return to the public meeting just to adjourn. My many thanks to the board members for their service today and all the people working to make this meeting possible. I would like to thank the team supporting us today especially. Mr. Philip Laird is the agency's general counsel and he's acting today as our meeting counsel and also providing presentation to us. Mr. Ashkan Sultani, who is here in his capacity as our executive director, and Ms. Maureen Mahoney, the agency's deputy director of policy and legislation, who has prepared two agenda items for us. I would like to express my gratitude, as always, to the team from the Office of the Attorney General and other agencies for continuing to support us and our moderator, Mr. Kevin Sabo. Mr. Sabo, could you please um, conduct the roll call? Yes. Board Member De La Torre. Present. De La Torre present. Board Member Lay. Present. Lay present. Board Member McTaggart. Here. McTaggart present. Board Member or Chair Urban. Present. Urban present. With that, Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. With four members, the board has established a quorum. I would like to let board members know that we will be taking a roll call vote on any action items. With that, we'll move to agenda item number two, which is a chairperson's update. Um, thanks again to everyone for joining us today. Um, I have a fairly short update. Um, I mostly wanna provide some reminders and updates regarding board meetings and business and an overview of how our schedule today fits into that. We've been following a fairly intricate meeting schedule and I'm hoping this will help orient everyone joining us today. 
Um, our focus has remained on our two most immediate tasks, which are building the agency and completing our first substantial rulemaking package. Regarding the rulemaking on October 28th and 9th, the board met, staff presented modifications to an initial proposed rulemaking package that went out in July, and the board approved those to go out for a 15-day comment period. We will have an update from the executive director on that in just a bit, but it seems we're on track for staff to have a full package incorporating the second round of comments ready for discussion in the new year, early in the new year. Um, with regard to building the agency, we have been steadily staffing up, building capacity for our responsibilities, focusing, focusing first on rulemaking, now um, also public awareness. I believe um, that there is work towards hiring the public affairs deputy. Um, soon we'll be working to build for enforcement and putting in um, place needed practices and procedures. We've been interspersing the rulemaking discussions with these more administrative and structural tasks. Today is largely a building, um, building the agency administrative meeting um, with that planned return to rulemaking in the new year. Uh, the executive director will give an update on that work in the next agenda item. Today's meeting topics are mostly items I previewed in September and October with the expectation that we would take them up this month. First, we discussed kicking off the strategic planning process. In October, I reported that the state procurement process for a vendor was proceeding. Today's update is that that process is ongoing. It is nearing completion, and we should begin be able to begin the process um, once a vendor is in place. Um, I hope, um, again, pretty early in the new year, and I'm looking forward to that. My thanks to Ms. Vaughn Chidambira, our Deputy Director of Administration, who for overseeing that process. Um, second, we discussed board oversight of an input into the yearly budget process, um, and I greatly appreciated the board's thoughts and ideas there. As mentioned in our previous discussion, I requested advice from council and staff who have put together a recommended plan for this um, and uh, have developed um, uh, something that will be um, presented by Mr. Laird during agenda item number five. Third, Ms. Mahoney and staff have put together a recommended process for regular updates on and consideration of legislation, which we'll discuss under agenda item number six. And Ms. Mahoney will also present staff's recommendation for the agency's appointments to the Children's Data Protection Working Group under agenda item number seven. The board will also, as I mentioned previously, go into closed session today, and that will be to discuss the executive director's annual review. We do have one rulemaking item um, today, an item from the new rules subcommittee on preliminary information gathering activities related to a potential future rulemaking package, which we'll take up as agenda item eight. Um, and then um, that is um, sort of, we have a series of specific things um, to work through to build our policies and build the agency. Um, and in the new year, um, with the changes in the board, um, we will return to these um, in a sort of a broader sense and talk um, about how we want to think about structure in the longer term. Um, so last, but most certainly not least, uh, I have two updates regarding the transition of two board colleagues. Um, first, in our next agenda item, we will take up a resolution honoring founding board member Angela Sierra. Second, um, I would like to ask um, Mr. Chris Thompson um, to join us if he's here. I believe he was going to join us today. Hello. Mr. Thompson, welcome very much. Um, we're delighted to see you. Um, I have the bittersweet announcement that Mr. Thompson is resigning from the board as he's been appointed chief of staff for Los Angeles mayor-elect Karen Bass. Um, is she still mayor-elect? When does she- She's mayor now. That's She's mayor place now. Place. I apologize to Mayor Bass. Um, so Mr. Thompson um, has taken um, a position as her chief of staff. We've been very fortunate to have Mr. Thompson's expertise, his outlook, and his dedication on the board. As we've moved through startup development and building stages, I have especially valued Mr. Thompson's focus on building an agency with a strong organizational foundation, including careful attention to culture and values. I was very much looking forward to your insight, Mr. Thompson, in the strategic planning process. And I regret that the timing is such that we will just miss out on your input into that. 
And I've really valued your even handed attention to all views in our rulemaking and other work. But I confess, I realize we can hardly deny Los Angelinos um, mayoral chief of staff um, with your depth of experience and knowledge and political thoughtfulness. So my deepest thanks to you, Mr. Thompson, for your work on behalf of Californians through the toughest stages of building the agency. And my very best wishes to you in your new role. Um, would you like, is there anything you'd like to say with no, you know, requirement at all? <laughs> uh, th just thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Urban. Thank you to all of our colleagues on the board uh, who, you know, from March of 2021 till now, the, the work to organize this agency, staff it up, uh, promulgate rules and, and do all of that, you know, starting off with five of us part-time. Um, and fortunately we had you full-time for, for a period uh, and, and some lone staff. The, the progress has been really, really heartening to watch. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of what we've done together. And I, I know that you all are gonna continue to do great things. I'm, I'm honored to have had the opportunity to serve on this board and, and to get to know and serve with all of you. Um, I regret that I'm not able to continue because it has been an incredible learning experience, but I feel like, you know, we did the hard part. So um, <laughs> it, it's all smooth sailing for from here. Um, but really, I mean, in all seriousness, it, uh, to the board colleagues, to the executive director, Mr. Sultani and, and the staff who've done an incredible amount of work, um, both the diligence, the, the competence, the work ethic that has been demonstrated from top to bottom and side to side of this agency is really something that we can be proud of, but I think that Californians can be proud of. So thank you for the opportunity to serve with you all. And I'm sorry that I can't continue. Thank you so much, Mr. Thompson. Uh, are there any comments or questions from board members? Ms. De La Torre? Thank you. Now, I just wanted to briefly um, state that it's been, as uh, the chairperson mentioned, a pleasure to have Mr. Um, Thomas with us. He has contributed in so many different ways. I have personally learned a lot from him and, and he will be missed. Um, we are sure that uh, it's to the benefit of um, the people of Los Angeles, but um, we, we will definitely um, miss his participation and his input. Um, of course, we are very confident that the governor's office uh, uh, will appoint a new member that will be um, a valuable addition to the board. But um, thank you so much for your participation, uh, Chris, and, and we, will, we will miss you. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Mr. Lay? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short. You know, uh, you know, Mr. Thompson, it's been a pleasure working with you on the uh, Outreach and Education Subcommittee through the hiring process and through all the other board meetings. Um, you know, I think I join the other board members in saying, you know, definitely will miss your experience and your humor. Um, you know, I, I definitely learned a lot about strategy and legislation just talking to you on this, on our subcommittee. And, uh, you know, sad I won't be able to continue doing that. But, you know, I know that Los Angeles is uh, in good hands, you know, with you, you as uh, Karen Bass's chief of staff. So, so thank you for your service. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Mr. McTaggart. Uh, Mr. Thompson, I didn't get very much chance to serve with you, but the, the, the little bit I did uh, have was a real pleasure. Um, and I will say just looking at your, the work here and then your work in the past, the mayor is lucky to have you uh, leading her office. Um, I've heard tell that uh, she's a good delegator, so I, I, I know you're going to be having your hands full. Uh, 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 and so I'm, you know, eager to see what good work you can do in in the great city of Los Angeles. Uh, and I'm also, you know, selfishly from our perspective of privacy, I'm I'm also uh, pleased because obviously the mayor has a huge megaphone in the state and nationally, and I know that the the next time that there's a threat. Uh, from out east um, to Californians' privacy, I'm, I'm sure we can count on you to to help amplify the the and get the you know the half the state that's in California that's in of California that's in Los Angeles mobilized to uh, 
to, to, to help our representatives in Congress understand what's going on. So anyway, thank you very much for all your work and the best of luck uh, in your new endeavor. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Mr. Sultani, you have appeared. So um, is that an indication that you would like to speak before I take the I would. Okay. I would. I'd just like to also say, uh, share my thanks um, and uh, express my gratitude for Mr. Thompson's work on the board and their, his incredible guidance, particularly around strategy and um, process. So thank you so much. Uh, and I wish you all the best um, as a, as a fe fellow Los Angeles, uh, having grown up in Los Angeles, uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, pleased that you'll be you'll be heading that up. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Mr. Sabo, I'd like to invite public comments at this time. Could you let me know um, if anyone would like to comment? Yes, so if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone, your name will be called when it's your turn and you'll be invited to unmute yourself. Those dialing in by phone can press star six to unmute. You'll have three minutes to make your comment. I'll give folks an opportunity to raise your hand now if you would like to make a comment. So again, if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or pressing star nine if you're dialing in by phone. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sabo. Thank you very much for joining us today, Mr. Thompson. Um, and with, with our continued thanks to him, we will now move to agenda item number three, which is a resolution to recognize distinguished service by former, or excuse me, I would say, I will say, um, we will put together a more formal acknowledgement for Mr. Thompson um, in the future. Um, and with that, we'll move to agenda item number three, which is a resolution to recognize the distinguished service by former board member Angela Sierra. And I would like everyone to turn their attention to the materials for agenda item number three, which are available on the website, um, and I believe the board has those materials ready. Um, in our last meeting, the board was able to offer its initial thank yous to Ms. Thompson for her service on the board. And I'm delighted that we now have the opportunity to more formally recognize her service. I believe Ms. Sierra is also joining us today. Thank you, Ms. Sierra, for joining us today. It's lovely to see you. Um, Ms. Sierra served as the Attorney General's appointee until her appointment to the Racial Identity Profiling Advisory Board. In her time on the board, Ms. Sierra brought her deep experience and knowledge of consumer law, enforcement, and government service her generosity of spirit and her gracious presence to the work of building the agency. I mentioned some of Ms. Sierra's specific contributions last time, but a few highlights include her foundational hiring work, including on the appointments for the executive director and general counsel, her work on organizational development and policy formation on the Startup Administration Subcommittee, as well as her contribution to the agency's rulemaking work on the update CCPA Rules Subcommittee. Today, I am pleased to present for the board's consideration a draft resolution honoring and expressing appreciation to Ms. Sierra for her many contributions. If the board will now turn its attention, please, to those materials for agenda item number three, you will find the draft resolution. The resolution reads, Resolution in Recognition and Appreciation of Distinguished Service by Angela Sierra. Whereas Angela Sierra, as a founding member of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board, through her dedication and countless hours of work, helped establish the first authority with full administrative powers focused on privacy and data protection in the United States, creating a legacy that will benefit Californians for decades to come. And whereas Ms. Sierra's decades of experience with the California Department of Justice enabled her to provide indispensable advice to the agency board and staff in creating the agency. And whereas Ms. Sierra worked closely with multiple California state agencies and staff to help establish the agency's key functions. 
and whereas Ms. Sierra helped shape proposed California Consumer Privacy Act regulations that place consumers in a position to exercise meaningful control over their personal information, and whereas Ms. Sierra impressed everyone with whom she worked with her wisdom, kindness, enthusiasm, dedication, and commitment to public service, and whereas Ms. Sierra consistently demonstrated her professionalism, integrity, and leadership, and has been an essential asset to the agency. And whereas Ms. Sierra has begun a new role as a member of the state of California's Racial and Identity Profiling Advisory Board, therefore, be it resolved that we, her colleagues on the agency board, extend our deepest appreciation for Ms. C Angela Sierra's service to the state and to the protection of Californians' consumer privacy. We look forward to continuing to work with Ms. Sierra and benefiting from our wisdom and expertise in the years to come. Ms. Sierra, did you have any comments you would like to make before we open it up for comment from the board? Yes, thank you, Chair Urban, and good morning, everybody. Um, well, thank you so much for your kind words and inviting me to join you today. Um, it means a lot to me. Um, I just want to say just briefly, um, it was such a, pri a privilege and a pleasure to serve on the board and to work with all of you. Um, you know, you just couldn't ask to work with a more um, committed, smart, hardworking group of people. So um, it really meant a lot to me, both professionally and personally. Um, you know, echoing um, Mr. Thompson's comments, um, I too am really proud of the work that we accomplished as a team during the first phase of building up the agency, um, putting in the initial building blocks for this important agency and getting to be part of, you know, hiring such an excellent leadership team and being part of working on the initial draft regulations. So, you know, it's just work that's just so important for all Californians and is gonna to touch the lives of everybody in the state. Um, I'm gonna be uh, missing you, missing working with you um, as a board member, but I am hopeful that our paths will continue to cross as I'm now with the California Department of Justice. I've returned there. And um, I'm just excited to see the great work that you're gonna be continuing to do as a board. Um, I want to congratulate also uh, former board member, Mr. Thompson. I'm very torn about this because I'm from Los Angeles. I live in Los Angeles. So it's fantastic um, and it's great for the city that he is going to be the chief of staff, but it's also a big loss for the board. So I'm torn about that, but I do want to send my congratulations to Mr. Thompson. And um, finally, I just want to wish everybody um, a happy holiday and wish everybody, the board and the staff, um, a you know, very happy and healthy new year. So thank you again. And it's just great to see everybody. Thank you so much, Ms. Sierra. Are there comments or questions from the board? Yes, Ms. De La Torre. Um, I just quickly wanted to thank Chairman Urban for putting together this resolution. There is not much more that needs to be said because I think the words state um, the valuable contributions of Member Sierra very, very well. As, uh, Member Sierra, you will be missed. Um, it was a pleasure to work with you and I really look forward to opportunities to collaborate with you in the future. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Mr. Lay? Yeah, you know, not much to add other than, the, you know, to, to thank you for your service. Um, and, you know, I, I definitely, you know, um, you were very much a moderating voice in a lot of our discussions. You brought a lot of experience and, uh, you know, helped balance out competing um, perspectives. And, you know, I very appreciated your role in doing that in, in building the agency and uh, definitely as well hope that our, path, our paths will cross again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lay. All right. Um, in that case, um, may I have a motion 
to adopt the resolution in recognition and appreciation of distinguished service by Angela Sierra. I so move. Thank you very much, Ms. De La Torre. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Thank you very much, Mr. Lay. Uh, motion has been moved by Ms. De La Torre and seconded by Mr. Lay. Um, Mr. Sabo, may I ask you to call for public comments? Of course. At this time, if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Your name will be called when it's your turn and you'll be invited to unmute yourself. Those dialing in by phone can press star six to unmute yourself. You'll have three minutes to make your comment. Again, if you'd like to make a comment, please go ahead and raise your hand at this time or press star nine if you're joining us by phone today. Madam Chair, it looks as though we do not have any comments this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, with that then, um, uh, would you please call the vote? Yes, so the motion pending is to adopt the resolution moved by Board Member De La Torre and seconded by Board Member Lay. Board Member De La Torre? Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board Member Lay? Aye. Lay, aye. Board Member McTaggart? Aye. McTaggart, aye. Chair Urban? Aye. Urban, aye. And the motion passes four to zero. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo, and thank you members of the board. The resolution is unanimously adopted with a vote of four to zero. Um, thank you all again, and thank you very much, Ms. Sierra. Um, thank, thank you for you. joining us today. Um, we will now move to agenda item number four, which is an update from our executive director, Mr. Ashkan Sultani. Um, he will be providing us with a hiring update, an update on scheduling for the current rulemaking and a budget update and anything else that he wishes to update us on. Um, Mr. Sultani, whenever you're ready, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Chair Urban. And thank you everyone for the opportunity to pre provide a brief update today. Um, as the chair outlined, I'd like to touch on three topics in my update, um, HR, rulemaking, and budget. So as I mentioned in my September update to the board, we've been staffing up steadily since the summer and are nearly finished staffing the legal policy and admin teams. We're also in the process of reviewing candidates for our CIO, budget manager, attorney five, and public deputy, uh, uh, deputy of public affairs. Um, we hope to have these hirings completed in January and the DDPA, the public affairs deputy, as previously discussed, we are happy to bring to the board um, prior to uh, confirmation of that position. Um, we're now in the process of finalizing recruitment packages as well for the uh, assistant chief counsel, as well as the deputy director of enforcement. And we're planning to post for these two positions in the coming weeks. Um, we anticipate the enforcement lead, the, the deputy director of enforcement, to be one of the more difficult recruitments given the specializations required, specifically someone with management, administrative enforcement, and privacy expertise. So we really welcome the board's help in amplifying the listing and um, kind of getting it out to the widest uh, group of candidates possible once it's posted. Moving on to regulations. Um, first, an update uh, on the uh, rulemaking process. So in our last meeting uh, on October 28th and 29th, the board directed some changes to the modified proposed rules and approved the revised text to go out for 15 day comment. Staff then prepared the modified proposed rules in response to the comments and invited um, those comments, uh, that common period, 15 day comment period, which ended on um, Monday, November 21st. That's actually slightly longer than 15, but there was a holiday there. So we wanted to give additional time. Um, in, in response to those, we received about 55 comment letters and approximately 450 pages. And these are all available on our website under the regulations um, page. Staff has completed its initial review of the 15 day comments period and sorry, 15 day comments and are working uh, through everything more fully. This includes preparing summaries and responses to all of the 45 and 15 day comments as well as updates to the statement of reasons that sets forth the necessity and policy reasons for the modifications made 
to the original draft of the regulations. As noted, comments are available for the board to review on the website and in binders for those who requested them. Staff are also available to discuss individually with board members if there are comments uh, that come to mind. Based on this stage of review, staff have informed me that they don't anticipate needing to recommend to the board any further changes to the draft regulations. Of course, this recommendation will need to come before the board and staff are still working to prepare their formal recommendation for the board to discuss and consider the next meeting. Staff also anticipates provide, being able to provide an updated statement of reasons along with proposed regulation for the board to review in mid-January with an eye towards a board discussion uh, uh, meeting in late January or the end of February. Staff will also be prepared to discuss comments and responses to those comments in advance or during that board meeting. Timeline-wise, and obviously contingent on the board's direction, at its earliest, staff believes it can be ready to submit the final rulemaking package to OAL, assuming no changes are made in early uh, to mid-February. Once submitted, OAL will have 30 business days to review, which is approximately 45 calendar days, meaning that if approved, the soonest the regulations could be in effect is, is in April. If OAL does not approve the regs, we would then have an additional 120 days to cure any deficiencies, including potentially revising the regulations and going out for additional comment periods as necessary. I just want to take a quick moment to thank the staff for so carefully and efficiently, efficiently reviewing the comments we've received and, and really their tireless work. Lastly, I want to provide an update on where we are with the budget and the budget change proposal at a high level. Um, our general counsel, Phil Laird, will be preparing, uh, will be separately presenting a recommendation for a process for oversight of the budget. So I'll just keep it uh, around the BCP now. So for the current year, 22-23, as I mentioned in my September budget update, our 22-23 budget was primarily focused on staffing of the agency's legal, admin, policy, and public awareness teams. The BCP requested 34 positions initially and as I've laid out, we've made significant progress towards our goal. There are still some positions that we haven't yet staffed, such as the head of enforcement, the chief auditor, and the bulk of the public affairs team, the latter on account of wanting to first have the public affairs deputy in place. Um, importantly, our expenditures are in line with our projections. And given that we have a number of open positions, primarily in public affairs, we expect to have a salary savings from the positions that are not yet filled. Moving on to uh, fiscal year 23-24, which begins July 1 of next year, we've submitted our proposed 23-24 budget change proposal to finance based on the anticipated direction of the agency as discussed in previous board meetings. Specifically, the fiscal year 23-24 BCP builds off our current year priorities of rulemaking, public awareness, but uh, rulemaking and public awareness but begins to incorporate our planned deliverables for the coming fiscal year. Specifically, we requested staffing for the enforcement team, which we will begin recruiting for later this spring and summer after we brought on the head of enforcement. We've also requested additional resources for IT in order to accommodate not only our growing IT needs, including the development and support of our consumer complaint system, as well as our state specialized IT and security needs to support enforcement. Lastly, the fiscal year 23-24 proposed budget stays within our $10 million statutory allocation, which has been increased by 2.5% to account for cost of living adjustments. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sultani. Um, it is the end of the year, and I just want to take the opportunity to thank the executive director for and all the staff as he has brought them on board for this really impressive work. Um, if we think about where we were at the end of last year with Mr. Sultani, and I think maybe um, Ms. Chidambira had started possibly the same day last year or a couple of days before, um, and hear this report now. Um, I think that we can all agree that um, it's just an extraordinary difference. Um, with regards to hiring, um, thank you, Mr. Sultani, for 
you know, giving us the basics and helping us understand um, the plan behind the build out. I just want to point out that hiring is foundational to the agency's ability to do its work. It's very difficult to accomplish on the timeline we need given state process requirements, which are important, but do add time. And it is always difficult to hire well. Um, to attract and match the right people to the right jobs, to build a positive culture. Um, and Executive Director Sultani, um, Deputy Chidambira, the HR team they've developed um, and put together have assembled just a really crackerjack group of people and they continue apace. Um, and the application process continues to attract really qualified, wonderful candidates to you know, our new agency, which hasn't had a chance to establish a reputation um, as a place to work. So this is a major accomplishment and I just want to take a moment to recognize it. Um, same for the rules, of course, we're not taking those up today, um, but of course we started that process last fall. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of public input. We've had a tremendous amount of work um, on the rules. They're complex, they're important. Um, and um, again, it's on a very tight and aggressive timeline. And I really want to extend appreciation and kudos to the executive director and to all the staff who I know have been working intensely um, uh, to continue um, to move us through that process. Um, uh, um, uh, and I look forward to um, considering those again in January. And, uh, and I appreciate the executive director's work on the budget process and look forward to um, the discussion of that in the next agenda item. So I just wanted to take a moment to pause um, and, um, and, and highlight that the updates we get reflect a really tremendous um, series of accomplishments. Um, so thank you, Mr. Sultani. Are there comments or questions from members of the board? Ms. De La Torre, excuse me. Thank you. I just have a quick question. Um, in terms of the appointment of the chief privacy auditor, where are we and what are the plans? I, I hear other titles, but I don't think I heard that one mentioned. Thank you. Mr. Sultani? Sure. Um, sorry if I wasn't clear. I, I did bring up that the chief privacy auditor um, has not yet been filled along with the Deputy Director of Enforcement. Um, we have not um, made plans yet to bring in the auditor as our audit function um, only begins after our enforcement function. So we're prioritizing bringing in our ACC and our head of enforcement, and then we will begin considering building up the enforcement team and then the auditor and uh, their respective support teams. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, just for kind of reference, I know that we cannot commit and this is a moving target, but are we thinking like mid next year will be a time where we will have that appointment made or can that question? Yeah, you know, we've been, um, we've been, I, I think it will depend on when we think our kind of enforcement processes will begin. Um, I think the rules will also need to be in place as we consider the process for which we undertake audits. So we were kind of waiting to sequence that out, take the board's guidance, and then start recruiting for that position as well. So perhaps sometimes next year will be a better prediction? Uh, for sure next year. Um, I, I don't quite I have a sense for when in the year. Um, they are currently um, in the BCP, so we could begin as soon as we like, but again, our function, our audit function doesn't really begin until at least July, um, if at, at the earliest. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Other questions, comments from the board? Mr. McTaggart. Uh, well, I, you know, joined late, so I, I, I only saw a little bit of it, but I would like to also add my uh, vote of thanks and just as an outside observer for most of the year, was really impressed with the work, not just you, uh, Mr. Executive Director, but the whole board did. So congratulations to everybody. Uh, just wanted to drill down a little bit, uh, Mr. Sultani, on the timing of the 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 regs here. Is there anything, you know, if 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 it's quote unquote just a meeting to approve 
uh, the recommendation to not make any changes. You know, I'm just as I hear April, and I'm wondering what's the what's the earliest we can uh, get those in, implemented and get some certainty out to the community. I'm just wondering, could we have a meeting in early January to, you know, is it is it is that a possibility? Is there any statutory saying it has to be the end of January? I mean, is, are there any statutory deadlines saying we can't have it before, you know, the normal two week notice period? I'm just I just think that time is is the enemy here, uh, and we should. Uh, you know, be moving things. That's the first question. The second question you can also maybe add at the same time is when OAL uh, rejects or approves, is there a way to submit? Is it always the same? And this might be a question for Mr. Laird, but can we submit in such a way that we say, look, uh, if you don't approve, you know, this regulation, can you at least prove all the other ones? Because, I, you know, or is it just all or nothing? Uh, Sort of, can you sever the the the, the uh, offending um, regulation if it comes to that? So timing and 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 then just because I just think urgency, you know, it's urgent that we get this stuff uh, uh, out to the community as soon as possible. Thank thank you. Um, why don't I take the first one and Phil, if you'd like to take the the second one on that first point? Um, you know, we, we are still in the process of reviewing the fifteen day comments to make sure that no changes are. Um, necessary uh, or whether or ascertain whether changes are necessary and staff are in the process of completing that and then preparing the materials for the board to review um, you know we surely can can um, schedule a meeting as, as soon as the board would like but we wanted to also give time for not only staff to prepare those materials for the board's review but also provide time for the board to review those materials and I, I worry a little bit that we, um, we we may need to um, schedule this for another discussion, but I'll kick off whether we can, you know, how far we can discuss this, Phil, during my update. And then if you'd like to take the second question as well. Um, sure. So um, thank you all. First of all, good morning to the board. Um, answering uh, Mr. McTaggart's question first. Um, uh, Historically, the Office of Administrative Law um, has allowed the practice in certain instances to, I think, as you described, sever certain problematic provision, uh, um, regulatory provisions. Um, however, that can really be on a case by case basis, um, especially depending on how interrelated certain regulations are. Uh, for instance, eliminating one regulation could sort of alter um, the interpretation or understanding of other regulations. So, um, uh, but but that said, there has been the practice before where Office of Administrative Law has handled that or has allowed for that. So, um, certainly, depending on the direction of the board at that future meeting, when we do discuss this um, substantively, uh, if there's direction to sort of pursue that option, if it becomes available, that is something that would be possible. Thank you, Mr. Sultania and Mr. Laird. Um, to Mr. McTaggart's very um, well taken concern about balancing soreness with speed, um, I do encourage all my fellow board members to take the opportunity now, you know, to go through the comments is that we have them and be ready for the um, other materials from staff as they get them to us. I know they've been working really tirelessly to get everything together. Um, in a form that is thorough and careful and available to us to review and time for us to look at it. So um, there is material now, and um, I agree with Mr. McTaggart, all possible, um, what is the term? Um, something, all judicious haste or something. Um, and that, that will help us be efficient. Um, Mr. McTaggart, um, you raised your hand again. Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm so I'm not really sure that I understood uh, Mr. Sultani. I mean, if it's a question of, okay, You'd like in an ideal world the board would go through these comments i mean how, you said there are 55 comments and how many pages um something like 500 pages if i uh if i remember correctly um no it's not that we we um expect the board to go through uh necessarily all of staff's responses to comments but we did want to provide both staff the ability and the board ability to review those take time to review those comments and then our justification for not making those changes now we can follow any any um, uh, process the board prefers um, to, to follow, but um, uh, you know I think we wanted to make sure because as previously you know we it will be you know um, a lot of material to review, um, but the you know 
um, it's really up to the board on that process. I will also add, we do have that 10 day period. So the soonest we could schedule a meeting is 10 days from now, which is into the holidays. Um, and and uh, and so we just want to kind of also be mindful of, of that as well. It, it, if you, the, you, I think I thought I, I thought I heard that um, you said that the staff had completed their pre preliminary review, and I'm just wondering, like, if if they have, if that's something that's, you know, with a maybe needs a little bit of cleaning up, but if it's if it's ready to share, and obviously it becomes a public document at that point, I mean. I just, I, when I heard end of January, early February, it feels like we're losing a month. And of course, I'm not suggesting we have something on December 31st or anything, but you know, that first week of January, I'm just wondering if there's a pre preliminary review available now, and, and it, I'm putting words in your mouth, so forgive me, I don't mean to, but it, it feels like you're saying that the, uh, the lion's share of the work or the review has been done. Uh, then is it possible that we could, you know, gain three to four weeks if we had something that first week of January? Um, I, I, I don't want to speak out of turn, so I'll defer to Bill and Lisa as to what we could have available. I just I think it will depend on um, what the board would like to see. That um, the materials right now are in kind of what I consider internal form, which is our spreadsheets and charts that have indicated what the comments are, trying to summarize them and started to put together what our um, kind of policy. Uh, or uh, you know whether, whether there's a statutory need to make those changes, and that's what we have. I don't think it's at a point where it's it's ready, and it will probably take a couple of weeks to get ready. But I don't want to. But it ultimately depends on kind of the thoroughness with with, with which the package uh, the board wants to see. For example, those responses. Um, we had thought the the updated ISOR, which is the narrative portion, which describes all of the changes and um, why they were made, et cetera, um, would be the most beneficial for the board in making a determination on, on the proposed rules. But we're also happy to take the board's input on what they like to see. Different boards have different practices with regards to um, what they'd like to see um, in, the, you know, in this process. Thank you, Mr. Masone. I'd like to give Ms. De La Torre an opportunity. Um, she's had her hand up for a little while. Uh, you're on mute. You're on mute, Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. Um, yes, quickly, um, I, I appreciate the conversation. I agree with the need of haste. I also agree with the need of thorough, thoroughness on the side of the agency. I just wanted to mention that I am assuming that um, if the package that is presented is presented in a format that might um, go to AOL, they, that means it will come with an FSOR, and that will be a very um, potentially, you know, time-consuming document for me personally to kind of get um, through. So if we could get that at least with 10 days in advance, if not more, it will be helpful, even though I understand that it might add a few days to our meeting um, date, I think it will be valuable to give the board the time to actually granularly go through the episode and kind of compare with the changes so that we can be more informed when we come to the board meeting. Um, so um, thank you for the update and um, just um, please consider that possibility of giving us the episode with enough time. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. And I had to ask about this. It seems that the updated eyesore that yes. is the substantive material. It's not called an FSOR until when? So Ms. De La Torre and I both went to rural school and I don't remember, like, so I was confused. Um, but it's, it is that, that is the substance of the, of the yeah, FSOR, I when I was saying the, that's right. When I was saying the updated up ISOR, it's effectively a, the narrative portion of the FSOR, which the board will review, which includes, you know, the policy reasonings, um, and the justifications for changes or not making changes. Phil, um, Lisa, I don't know if you want to add anything. Or correct me, as I'm not, you know, as, as this is. Um... Yeah, happy to just add that. Um, I, I think everybody's essentially saying the same thing and are, are correct here. The final statement of reasons is a very lengthy document that has a lot of required elements. 
One of those required elements is the update to the initial statement of reasons that Mr. Sultani has been referring to, um, which again is that narrative portion, the necessity for all the changes appearing in the final version of the regulations. Um, in addition, there's other requirements, for instance, a finding of whether or not uh, the regulations impose a local mandate, as well as um, the summary of public response uh, of public comments and responses to those comments. So the portion Mr. Sultani is sort of focusing on is is, is sort of the the um, uh, core narrative explanation of, of why why the the agency would be choosing to adopt these regulations. And if I can, before before um, we get, I'll just flag um, as as a um, as background the DOJ's package for their rulemaking. This this package, if you recall, was on the order of five hundred or so pages, um, which included um, the narrative portion as well as all the summaries and, and, and such. Thank you, Ms. Kim. I just wanted to also add to address Mr. McTaggart's concern. I don't believe we'll be losing time necessarily because this whole time period in which we're working, we're preparing all the summaries, all the responses, everything in picture, uh, the entire package to be ready to go when the board makes their decision. Um, regardless of whether the board decides to modify further um, or just take the final regulations as they are, um, we still have to prepare those materials. And so that's what we're diligently working on and the expected, we anticipate being done with all that we need to be done with if the board were to um, to approve the board's, uh, the regulations as is by end of January, early February. That would be like the earliest we could prepare the entire package. So we're hoping that you know, whatever meeting, whatever we're able to provide to the board by mid um, January is really the quickest that we can get everything together. Can I, can I clarify that? Uh, just take a, so, so, um, so there's everything that's filled laid out, like the mandate and uh, additional documentations that we need to get in picture, you know, in photo ready form. And, and staff believes we can get that ready by the end of January, beginning of February. We had hoped to provide the core um, kind of the updated ISOR and other and and be available for discussions around the comments in mid January, so that would give staff would give the board time to review what are the essential materials in advance of that final package being ready at the end of January, for and at which point the board can take a decision. And if the board agrees with staff's recommendation, it would take just a few days, maybe a week, to take. Um, any additional final touches and get that over to AO, OAL. So, um, so we wouldn't have to wait to have the board meeting for that final, the very final, like polished, bit, polished version, uh, polished entire thing, which would which will take and by itself until the end of January, early February. Then it would be two weeks later for the board meeting. So this proposed schedule or what the what the staff is proposing would get the board. Um, materials that are necessary and have a discussion two weeks prior to that okay indeed and it also and it allows for one additional stuff that i may which is that we expect that even in you know photo ready by you know the end of january there might be small you know typos punctuation corrections that we'll still need to to make so we think this process allows again the board to review the core substance um, then meet in, in the end of January, beginning of February to approve the recommendation and then still give a little bit of time for staff to make those adjustments and corrections before finalizing and submitting to OIL. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Um, Ms. De Troy. Thank you. I'm just a, a bit confused. I, I'm going to repeat back what I think I understand because I heard different things. So should we expect as the board to be brought back to a meeting where we will make a determination on whether we move forward or not without having a final statement of reasons ready at that point. We will just have an updated version of the ISER. Is that, is that the expectation that we should have? So I can take this and then Phil and, and Lisa jump in. So one, am I correct that the FSOR, the updated ISOR um, eventually becomes the, or is a key component of the of, of FSOR. It's a portion of the FSOR, exactly. That's right. And, and our expectation is to provide, our, our plan is to provide that core piece to the board uh, in mid-January, and then the additional pieces as they become ready over between ja mid-January and 
soon as the board is willing and interested in meeting, which could be as soon as the beginning of February, all the way up to the end of February, if the board wants to see the, the, the picture perfect version of everything. And so our thought is to, in order to make the determination, the key pieces of information the board would be interested in is that uh, updated ISO or the narrative portion, as well as responses to comments, which we can have and discuss during that time. Okay, let me repeat back just to make sure that I understand. So the final statement of reasons, I remember it from the last rule making, it has that detail um, section by section explanation versus the ISO that is more a narrative. And what we're thinking is that we will meet as a board with an awareness of the ISO, but we will not meet again and the EFSA will be prepared by the agency and provided to um, the Office of Administrative Law without a, a second meeting by the board? Is that is that the plan? I'm just trying to get clarity. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, that section by section analysis, I think you're referring to is what also what we're referring to as the updated ISOR. Is that not correct, Lisa? Yes, like uh, I think there's been different kinds of nomenclature that's been used. I, I characterize it as the narrative portion of the FSOR. So whatever a statement of justification policy that will be uh, available to the board in mid-January so that the board has it available, has time to review it um, before making its decision about what final regulations to submit to the Office of Administrative Law. Um, to the extent that there is also the appendices to the FSOR, which is all the summaries and responses to comments, that's something that we are continuing to prepare and we will be available to the board if there are any particular comments um, that they would like us to uh, like to discuss with us, um, either prior to the meeting or at the meeting um, that the board will be holding. But, but how will we know? If we don't uh, see them, I, I'm just well, a little confused. So how, how will we know, know what are the okay. responses to the comments if we don't see them? Well, we, we as, as I mentioned, the current comments, both the 45 day and 15 day are available to the board. And so the board can go through and inquire with staff what we anticipate to say or what we're planning to say um, in response to those comments. And we will be preparing that material to be ready sometime around the board meeting, but we may not have the photo finished ready, version ready um, until, uh, so the, here, the, the, we, we won't be able to have the photo finished ready, version ready of the responses, the summaries and responses to comments and the narrative portion of the um, ISOR, uh, you know, the, the, the core component of the FSOR until the end of January. That's current, our current plan. So if the board would want to wait until all those materials are ready until the end of January, we could also then plan to add an additional two weeks or however much time the board needs to um, meet and review that. That um, as an alternative, what we're proposing is instead provide the core narrative portion of the ISOR plus an opportunity to ask us about any comments and any responses to comments based on the comments that are currently available publicly and then have that have that as a way to streamline the process so that the board get um, substantive um, kind of understanding of our justification and our responses, as well as questions to specific commenters responses and still um, allow us to meet in early January, uh, uh, beginning of February. But we're open, you know, in this case, open to whatever the board prefers. And we can and we can work through it. And I appreciate all of the work that's done. I, I'm not meaning to, um, you know, suggest that the final version that is picture ready, like you mentioned, be provided to the board. But I think that what will be really helpful to me is to have this structure way in which the EFSA goes through each comment in some format available, so that we can have a cohesive list of comments that were filed. I have been reading comments, but I have not created on my end like a list of the different topics that are in the comments. I understand that to be part of the FSR and I will appreciate if we have 
some version of it. It doesn't need to be the final version, but some version that reflects just the, the list of the different comments that were filed and, and some form of our reaction to it. Even if we don't, let, let me put it this way, even if we cannot get a list of our answers because we're still working on them, if we can just get a list of the comments, then I will know which comment I can reach out to a member of the agency to maybe have a conversation about. Does that make sense? That's what I'm saying makes sense. Okay. It does, and, and I'm happy to um, uh, chat with uh, Lisa and Phil and the rest of the team as to when when uh, that that particular deliverable um, would be available, and then plan if if that is um, something the board wants. Plan to essentially give the board enough time to review, given staff enough time to produce both the narrative portion and this summary of comments without necessarily the answers, uh, but um, right. and and have that available to the board with you know two weeks or so time to the board um, to review before meeting. And I'll just flag that that we or automatically get two weeks or you know 10 days, but really often two weeks because of the way our notice process works anyway. So it takes us 10 days before uh, for Bagley Keen as well. And to Mr. McTaggart's point, it's okay if it's a draft. It's just very helpful to have like this structure view of each comment because I personally don't, you know, I remember some of the comments, but I haven't been able to digest them in the way that our staff has. So any awareness of that list will be helpful to me. That's 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 helpful. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Um, Mr. McTaggart. Thank you. Um, so am I understanding it, uh, Ms. Kim, Mr. Sultani, and Mr. Laird, uh, that even if you had, you're not going to have the materials necessary to submit to OAL before a certain time, which is the end of January anyway, so you're not losing any time by having that meeting then, assuming we don't make any changes at that point. That's correct. So, okay. So then my, my point would be, again, I, I'm just, I would, at least my, 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 my approach, and I would urge others to, to think of this too, is because we have this requirement to get these things in place as soon as possible. And it's, it's, it's both a legal and a, I, you know, I just think it's a, it's good for the industry, uh, for, for the community, for advocates, for everybody to know what, what, what's coming down the pike. I would really urge us to think about being satisfied with whatever staff produces on the, on the 15th, being able to use that for the meeting, you know, at some point we, you know, the, as a board, hopefully we're, 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 putting confidence in our staff to come up with recommendations. So, so approving those regs. And then if we have changes in the future to take that as a, as a, okay, now we'd like you to look at these changes, but for a future rulemaking package, but so we, at least we can get something in the, in the hopper, so to speak, and get that uh, to, to over to OAL, uh, because I really think that's a critical uh, for us. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, and thank you very much to the staff for coming up with this Sort of, I think of it as kind of a funnel model um, where the board is getting the information necessary and staff are putting together the information necessary for OAL on as fast a timeline as possible um, while allowing the board to have a careful review, which I appreciate Ms. De La Torre's um, comments, which I think were um, directed towards a careful review and Mr. McTaggart's comments, which are directed toward um, moving as quickly as we can. So I appreciate the staff's careful thinking about how to try um, to uh, provide all of that so far as possible. Um, yeah, if I may. Oh, sorry. Mr. Lay, did, did you um, have anything um, just because I wanted to be sure you had an opportunity? No, I, I think... Um... You know, I, I appreciate you know getting this out as fast as I can. Um, I I trust staff to figure out the um, the best way to do that for us and with the capacity they have. So, uh, I'm I'm happy with whatever structure that um, was proposed. Thank you very much, Mr. Lay. Uh, Mr. Sultani. Uh, that's it. I just want to thank the board for their input and 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 just echo um, your remarks, Chair, and which is that the process we're trying to put together intends to effectively provide the board with the information they need to make uh, substantive decisions about the rules with, and have enough time to review those rules without also impacting staff's time. So we're basically, you know, it's a, we're gonna, if this is a diner, we're getting it to you as the orders are ready. 
right? And so we're going to prioritize that um, updated state segment of reasons. We're going to uh, provide then the, um, as um, Ms. De De La Torre requested, the at least the summaries of the comments or at least the markings of the comments to the board and then um, plan to, uh, with our goal of assuming the board's direction agrees with staff recommendation, um, we're planning to provide uh, those uh, kind of as much as is, is necessary to have almost a finished package by the end of January. So that is our date and we'll provide the materials starting in mid January until that date. And then we'll take the board's guidance on when they will be ready to meet and discuss uh, these recommendations. And again, this all hinges on the, the board may decide they to not agree with staff's recommendations and then we can just iterate. But I just, we're just trying to do it in an efficient way and provide everyone with all the data they need. So thank you for that feedback. Thank you, um, but, Mr. Sultani. And, and, and Lisa, Phil, do you guys want to add anything? Just because I, I don't want to just want to give you guys the opportunity. Um, no, I, I, I don't really have much more to add. I, I hear your concerns about having that balance. I hear both um, Mr. McTaggart's concern about being as efficient as possible, as well as uh, Ms. De La Torres and other um, trip, uh, members to you know, have enough information to make decisions. So we'll do our best to um, provide what is what would help the board make its decision as quickly as possible, while at the same time doing our best not to slow down so that we can be ready as soon as the board does make decisions. Thank you. And I'll just thank Lisa and her team for the outstanding work they've continued to do this whole time. It's it's pretty impressive what they've been able to turn out so far. Thank you, Mr. Laird. All right, um, any further comments on the board um, from, the, excuse me, any further comments from the board? Uh, and uh, if not, I would like to ask Mr. Sabo to check for public comment. Uh, if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature by pressing star nine on your phone if you're dialing in today. Your name will be called when it's your turn and you'll be invited to unmute yourself. Those dialing in by phone, I can press star six to unmute, uh, and then you'll have three minutes to make your comments. Uh, I do see Phil Morine's hand raised. Hi, uh, can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Perfect, uh, thank you, I, I appreciate um, I appreciate everyone's hard work here. Um, my question is, uh, so with January 1st fast approaching, is it is it safe to assume that this will not be going into effect January 1st and that this might be going into effect in towards more of April? Um, let me know if I if 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 that's not kind of correct those date or that timeline, just from a from the business side, just a lot of organizations are looking at the January 1st date, and it looks like that is is starting to to move. Um if I'm hearing correctly, if if that's the case, will there be any public um, notifications, you know, kind of stating that um, uh, on your site that that date will be moving? Um, and that's kind of just my my question here today. Uh, thank you very much. The um, the statute, the law, uh, goes into effect on January first. The regulations will go into it that implement and provide uh, extra information about the law will go into effect when they are approved by OAL. Uh, any further public comments from the group, Mr. Sabo? I do see a hand raised by an entity named Privacy Attorney. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you to the board and the CPPA staff and especially the AG staff in finalizing the regulations. Um, similar to the previous commenter, uh, we're helping uh, clients. I'm a privacy attorney, as you can probably tell <laughs> by the name I'm using. Um, we're helping clients get uh, ready for compliance. And one concrete point that I I know the board is not obligated to respond, but what concrete a uh, point that I had and clarification that I wanted was Mr. Sultani said that the staff does not anticipate making any further modifications to the regulations, even though the staff is preparing all the other 
auxiliary documents like the statement of reasons that we, you all were discussing. So I just wanted to make sure that for the purpose of advising clients and planning that that understanding is correct, that there, there likely will not be any further modifications, but the staff will is still reviewing the comments and will be issuing the FSORs and ISORs and, and things of that nature. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, privacy attorney. Any further public comment? All right, Mr. McTaggart, let's circle back to you, please. Yeah, I just, I just actually think it's a, it's a, it's a very reasonable request from the first commenter, um, and I'm just wondering whether a statement from us or something saying, you know, obviously that the, and maybe it's just stating what the fact is, and so it's maybe the question for Mr. Laird, but just stating that the existing regs for CCPA stay in effect until the new regs are adopted, so that people can have certainty that you know, oh, there's not, you know, there's not any kind of. Um, you know, uncertainty if they're advising clients or something like that. I, and so I, I just, I think that's kind of what the, what the previous question was about. And 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 um, so I just, how would you, Mr. Laird, how would you give people clarity on that on that front? Um, I, I I think, and you know, feel free, Lisa, to jump in if you have any further thoughts here. But um, I think my my statement would just be that you know the existing regulations uh, that are in effect and were put into an effect. Um, with the assistance of the attorney general's office um, remain in effect and um, the proposed regulations we've been discussing today will not be in effect until they are adopted by the board and approved by the office of administrative law there is an faq on our website that sets out a lot of this if not all of this information um, and i think that if um, it's amenable to staff um, i would request that uh, we just take a look and make sure that it it's clear on this point um, for the public. Um, Ms. De La Torre. Um, I was just going to make the exact same suggestion to update the website to make sure that the statement there is clear. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, Ms. Kim, and then Mr. Sultani. I just wanted to also add that if you are part of the email listserv for the regulations, um, you will receive all the updates regarding when um, we submit things to OAL and, and basically everything that happens. Um, that's the best way to stay in touch as quickly as possible with regard to the developments here. Thank you, Ms. Kim. And I haven't touted the email lists in a while, so I'm going to do that now. Um, if you go to our website, you can sign up for the list that Ms. Kim mentioned, which is specifically related to the regulations. And you can also sign up for notice of board meetings um, and other things. So please do that if you're interested in following um, the agency's activities through that channel. Um, Mr. Soltani, did you still? Um, okay, Ms. Kim covered it. That's right. it. And I'll, I'll also just add that um, that FAQ and the link to sign up on the website was also just po posted in the Zoom chat if folks want to also go there and sign up. So thank you for uh, mentioning that, Ms. Kim. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Sultani. Um, with that, I would like to thank the board for its careful attention to um, all of the items on Mr. Sol in Mr. Sultani's update and its careful attention to the rulemaking while we all work um, to get this completed for the public. And um, let's now move on to agenda item number five, board and agency policies and practices, um, specifically a budget policy and overview. Um, if the board will please turn its attention to the materials for agenda item number five, you will find a memorandum from Mr. Philip Laird, um, our, our uh, general counsel, with recommendations for our process for board input and oversight of the budget. I wanna thank all the board members, um, current and past, um, for thoughts that went into my request um, for staff to research this and put together recommendations for us, um, and very much thank Mr. Laird and staff for their work on it. Um, with that, Mr. Laird, I will turn things over to you. Thank you, Chair Urban. Um, so for this agenda item, I would like to start by providing a high-level overview of how the state budget is negotiated and passed each year and then describe the process that staff is proposing by which the board can provide meaningful input and direction on the development of our agency's annual budget. 
Um, so to give just a quick high level budget overview of sort of how the process works in California, um, our state constitution requires the governors to submit a proposed budget by January 10th of each year for the following fiscal year. And this was mentioned earlier, the fiscal year runs from July 1 to June 30th. So it does cross calendar years. Um, the proposed budget is reviewed by the legislature then throughout the spring through a series of committee hearings. Um, and then uh, in May, a, the governor um, prepares a what's called the May revise uh, by May 14th, which is an update to that initially proposed budget um, that uh, reflects sort of both the results of some negotiations, as well as also is supposed to update the budget according to the latest inf uh, information that comes available after tax season in April. Um, the legislature then has until June 15th to pass a final budget, and the governor generally has 12 days after, from that point to sign the budget into law, which would then immediately commence the budget year spending and uh, expenditure authorities beginning July 1st. Um, now, development of that governor's proposed budget begins much earlier than January 10th, as you can imagine. Uh, it usually begins pretty much as soon as the last budget's signed, um, starting in, the, in July. And the Department of Finance, on behalf of the governor's office, solicits what's called a budget change proposal from all state entities, um, usually around in September, and then engages with these agencies throughout the fall to better understand the basis for the requests and assess whether it should be included in the governor's proposed January 10 budget. Um, as the executive director mentioned earlier, our agency's BCP for the 23-24 fiscal year is currently under consideration through this process. So with that high level overview in mind, um, in our meeting materials today, we did prepare um, a recommendation for how um, we think would be the best opportunities for this board to engage in uh, budget review and giving budget direction uh, to staff. We think there's two primary opportunities for the board to give such input and direction. Um, and so the first one is that in around J June or July each year, we propose that the board um, meet and hear uh, meet to hear and consider um, what I will call a budget plan that the staff will prepare, uh, which will recommend fiscal priorities and budget change proposal or budget change goals and concepts for the upcoming fiscal year. In alignment with whatever direction the board gives at that meeting, staff will then spend the fall preparing and submitting a BCP to finance to work through that process to, to, to um, promote what would be our, our um, requests uh, in, in the governor's Jan 10 budget. Um, the second primary meeting um, that we envision would occur then sometime probably early in January or February, early in the new year, um, after the release of the governor's Jan 10 budget proposal. And this would be staff's opportunity to brief the board more thoroughly on what exactly um, the governor determined to um, include in his or her proposed budget, and then would also allow the board another chance to provide further direction and clarity on priorities that staff should be pursuing during the springtime budget negotiations with the legislature, which as we know, um, you know, the budget proposal on January 10th is not necessarily the budget proposal that will be signed into law at the end of the spring. And so understanding there's further opportunities to sort of uh, promote and pursue um, um, the sort of fiscal interests of our agency, um, there would be that sort of second opportunity for the board to further um, direct staff how, how to, how to um, participate and engage in those negotiations. Um, so from a high level, that's my summary. Um, I, again, I, I do uh, encourage everybody to also review the materials, uh, you know, in connection with this agenda item. Um, this process, you know, it, uh, is at a high level, but we think it balances the importance of meaningful board oversight and direction for our agency's budget uh, with the need for staff to be able to nimbly advocate for that budget through the state process that I've described here at the beginning and throughout. So at this point, um, I will I will stop talking. And uh, uh, but of course, any questions or feedback from the board about anything I've outlined today are welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Laird. Um, I again want to express my appreciation, and I will start off by saying that I think that this is a nice balance. The board's appropriate role is to provide strategic guidance on priorities. I don't think the best role for the board is to be involved is is to be involved in the nitty gritty implementation, but the board should provide oversight 
um, of the staff's implementation. So this sort of two part structure makes a lot of sense to me. The board can set priorities and then we'll be able to check in on implementation um, later on. So thank you very much, Mr. Laird, for putting it together and I look forward to discussion. Ms. De La Torre? Uh, please, you're on mute, Ms. Lelatore. Apologies again. Um, I agree with what was stated by uh, um, Chairperson Urban, and I appreciate the uh, update from Mr. Laird. We had a little bit of, a, um, I think, miscommunication in a prior meeting, and I think this clears it. My um, suggestion will be to um, consider how other similar agencies are engaging in the process of um, providing um, high level oversight on budget, which to me directly connects with the strategic priorities. I know we're still working uh, from the chairman's update on onboarding uh, external resource that can assist with that. So my suggestion for this topic will be to maybe bring it back next year once we onboard that resource and we start to um, develop our strategic priorities. And, um, and also once we have a new appointee from the governor who I think should be part of this conversation and uh, think about how uh, we can best structure the board permanently in terms of our um, interaction with the staff of the agency for the strategic priorities and the high level oversight of the budget. Thank you, Ms. De La Troy. Just to clarify, um, the strategic planning process is likely to operate at a somewhat higher level than the yearly budget strategy process. Of course, they're in, in, they're in close communication with each other the overall strategic process for the agency sort of longer term. And then that of course connects to strategy for each year's budget priorities. Um, but just to clarify there, I don't see any hold up on the board considering um, budget priorities. And then when we have like an overall strategic plan at that higher level, of course we will match those um, up as, as we go forward into the future. Uh, Mr. McTaggart. Great. I, I have a couple of questions here. So, um, so in June, July, I mean, at some point during the year, do we get granular enough where if the director comes to us and says, you know, it's one thing to say, I want to fo focus on enforcement this year, which is kind of, you know, loosey goosey, but if he's, you know, do we get as a board sort of the granularity of, and I understand there's, there's, politics with the with the Department of Finance around actually, you know, publicizing, you know, prior to whenever it's released the actual dollars. But I mean, as a board, surely we, we're going to have to have some kind of ability to say where the director says, I'd like to hire three new enforcement people this year, two new public relations people. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, is that, do we get, is that part of the sort of June, July process where, uh, that's what, you know, Mr. Sultani will come along and say, okay, here's my plan for the agency. Here's the build out. Here's how, how many staff in this different areas. Um, Mr. Laird. Yes. Um, and, and of course, I'll welcome Mr. Sultani to jump into if he has further thoughts. Um, I, I, I do think our budget plan, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Sultani, would be fairly comprehensive. Um, I, I don't know if the, the vision at this point, although as we build this, we can continue to kind of flesh out what we think is the most helpful for, to the board at this stage. Um, if it would be as granular as the specific numbers and classifications of positions being requested at that stage. Um, although again, I'll, I'll defer to my executive director. Um, by the same token though, what I will note is, you know, when the budget change, if a budget change proposal is approved by the governor's office and by the Department of Finance for that Jan 10 release, um, at that point, we will be able to come back to the board as, we, as we've suggested, this sort of second touch point. Um, 
explain what's been uh, provided in that proposed budget. And then, as I mentioned earlier, if, the, if that will have the granularity of these are the positions that the governor's office has put into the proposed budget. If, for instance, there is interest in the board at that point to pursue something different or, um, or increased, we would be able to take that direction as, as staff and try to promote that, that those goals, you know, through, I'm through negotiations. About I'm much more concerned about before. I mean, it's great to know after the preliminary approval, but surely as a board for 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 uh, for oversight purposes, we'll need to be able to say, generally we agree, yes. Uh, and I again, clearly, if it's like we didn't get the photocopy we were asking for, we're not looking for that level of granularity. But I but I do think as a board, it's incumbent on us to to approve the direction that the that the administration wants to take it in. That's sort of a basic board function. Um, and I'm super happy to have that not be, you know, line item by line item in terms of dollar figure. But I do think at a, at a basic level, some of the most important stuff like enforcement or the key, you know, we'll, we'll need to know where the executive director wants to grow the agency. Um, so that's kind of it would be one of my uh, if that happens in June, July, then great. And then, yes, we can look at it. Do we get it in, in January? Fine. But personally, I would, I, I'm just interested in that process there. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sultani, I think you had an update and then Ms. Delatore. I can respond or we can ha have um, Ms. Delatore go and then I can try to respond to both. Either one. Okay. Whatever you Delatore, say. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, I just wanted to mention that I am. Um, I totally agree with what Mr. Matt Taggart was uh, sharing. That's kind of how I have seen board function more in the private sector, where, is, where I have more expertise. Um, and one suggestion that I think we should consider once we um, have the new appointee from the governor's office um, is the possibility of creating a, a subcommittee that is a two member subcommittee that can help balance the need for granular conversation if there is a need uh, with just not taking too much time of the board time. Like we could have the one meeting that I think is the suggestion of Mr. Lair and also a forum where there's a need for a more, um, more engagement that can happen. And um, will also help preserve that balance between what information should be uh, rightfully made public and, and what information may be uh, too specific to be brought to um, board meeting. That's my understanding of how the uh, Fair Political Practices Commission is structured. Um, and so I welcome a conversation about that perhaps um, next year when we have a new appointee of the governor's office. Thank you, Ms. Ms. De La uh, So I don't, Maybe I am missing something, but I don't hear any substantive disagreement among the various points of view in the discussion. I do hear examples of the kinds of information the board members think is appropriate or helpful. Um, I would slightly amend um, Mr. McTaggart's good example from my own point of view, which is that I just, I absolutely agree that having a concrete picture is important for the board. I have a little bit of allergy just because I've done a fair amount of hiring um, that we don't accidentally create a rigid situation um, that doesn't hold up um, in the face of um, Cal HR or something like that. So if we could, if if we could do something like, you know, in the range of X positions. You know, three to four, or um, or a proportion. You know, this is the proportion of the staffing that that staff are thinking. Um, I think that might um, work with a little bit more flexibility. But I also realize that I my view is that this is a thoughtful plan um, in response to Ms. De La Torre's um, question earlier. I do believe that it took into account um, a number of models of um, how. Uh, boards do this. Um, and so I would like to try um, the plan and process that Mr. Laird has set out for us. And of course, we can revisit it and we will naturally visit it um, when we have our first meeting. 
um, and we can um, we can see then, um, and we will have our new board member in place by then as well, um, if that is um, the appropriate amount of information for us. Mr. Lay? Yeah, I, I, I would second that. I, I mean, I think this the plan that uh, Mr. Laird laid out uh, makes sense to me. You know, I, I'm involved with, you know, several other committees and boards where we we, we do review budgets. Um, and, you know, this this seems to be aligned with that. And uh, in particular, actually gives more, um, hopefully more private, more input for us than, you know, uh, I, I have at the, maybe my committee to the CPUC. So I think this is a good middle ground. Um, I definitely don't want to be involved in the, granular day-to-day -day setting out GS 13s or whatever, you know, whatever is necessary for Cal HR. I think my time is better spent on the strategic planning, which can inform the budget. So, um, you know, this, this approach makes sense to me. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, Mr. Sultani. Thank you for that input. Um, I did, I wanted to just um, respond to a couple of quick comments. Uh, and first off, I think this is, I, I value the board's input on this process as we're trying to figure it out. You know, it's a uh, it's um, every agency likes to pursue it differently. So I appreciate the willingness of this agency to engage, or our agency to engage. Um, and uh, and to Mr. McTaggart's point of you know providing input as to like how many or the general general makeup. I have no concern in doing that at a high level. You know, not just saying we have a priority. I mean, our priority is enforcement, but you know we'll we'll look to grow it by some percentage or something like that. I'm not even okay with. Um, I do caution about specific numbers and specific makeup to Mr. Lay's point, which is that there are these other requirements such as like the span of control of how many attorney fours versus attorney threes versus attorney ones versus what their makeup is and what their support staff are and what their classifications are. And there's a bunch of kind of formulaic processes that go through negotiation with finance and really around the rules set out by Cal HR that we then have to undergo to kind of create the configuration of a team that are based on state hiring rules and state processes. And so there's like, if the board wants 10, there's no guarantee that we will get 10. And importantly, um, we may also negotiate with the Department of Finance where they say, given considerations, we might approve five this year, and then you can come through the May revised for another five. There's also a number of considerations that would then reveal our negotiations with the Department of Finance, which are often sensitive. So for those reasons, I think like general broad strokes of direction, um, you know, uh, general percentages, et cetera, would be valuable. And then again, as Mr. Laird laid out, January 10th, the specific requests are then visible to the board. And then we can say, no, we can specifically make changes. And at that point, we can highlight perhaps why those changes were made or why the justifications for, as I, as I said, like the makeup of the enforcement team needs to have a distributed uh, classification of attorneys that are, that are not all the same class. Um, so I don't know if that provides a little bit of color, but as general, I think this is a helpful process. I just wanted to give the contours at which we operate when we create the BCP and some of the other considerations, which I don't know um, if the board wants to be involved at that level or can be. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Um, Mr. McTaggart. Thanks. And I, and I think, you know, the, obviously we'll, we'll see what it is in, in, in July, but I just, I, I do want to, um, uh, uh, maybe add a slightly different take on on that. While I understand that there's a difference between you know what we ask for and what we ultimately get, and things happen along the way, and you can't find the person you were hoping to hire, and at the beginning of the process in July, it'll be aspirational because we won't know what the end result will look like. I also, I'm not particularly. I, I don't think it's our role necessarily just to kind of rubber stamp something ex post facto and be like, oh, great, this is what you applied for. I'd like to know more than just, oh, we plan to, you know, uh, we plan to focus on enforcement this year. And I, so I personally, I don't know that it's so hard to say, you know, here's where we're going to grow this year. Here's our current staffing. We've got 27 staff here. We've got 34 staff here. We plan to have it 40 by the end of the year, you know next budget year and here's where we want to hire them we may or may not i mean clearly life happens and you can't get the people you're looking for but i don't know that there's anything super um uh you know, operationally impossible about you know the executive director of an organization saying here's where i'd like to grow and i and i and i think it's really appropriate for us 
because otherwise what we're really as a board doing is after the stuff is kind of fully baked in i know i know that the budget in january is not a final final but it's harder to change things once they're kind of set in wet cement um you know, I think it's I, I I do think what I'm saying is not asking for a lot to say I'd like a pretty detailed view because otherwise as a board, you know, we're talking a lot of money here and and, and directionality. So I I'm I, I do think we should have more more information in July and understand that it will change because you you know you won't be able to hire the right people or there'll be this negotiation over level three versus level four or whatever it is. So Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. And again, I don't hear disagreement here, and I don't think that's incompatible with the proposal that Mr. Laird put forward at all. I think what we're discussing are board members' um, sort of preferences and priorities for level of granularity. Um, it sounds to me as though the board all understand that there are both practical um, uh, limits to how far down the granularity might go. Um, and I don't hear disagreement among the board about generally sort of the appropriate um, level at which oversight should land. Um, Mr. McTaggart has expressed a fairly sort of concrete idea for the kind of information he would like to see in July. Um, and I don't think that is incompatible with what Mr. Laird has proposed. It's certainly not incompatible with what I think. I just want to be sure that the staff understands what the board is asking and then has the ability to implement it. And we haven't accidentally tied the staff's hands. And I don't think anybody else has a different view from that. Um, there is probably a slight variance, a continuum among the board as to how interested various members will be in how much detail for different things, and that's completely fine. Um, but my um, takeaway from the conversation so far is that the proposal um, accommodates the board's considerations. I think staff have received concrete, helpful information um, for that first um, pass that we'll see um, in July. Um, and what I would suggest is that boards that the, excuse me that the that staff take the discussion into account, um, and we can kick the tires um, on what we what we hear from staff um, when it comes up, and if we want to direct something more. Um, detailed or less detailed um, at that time we can. Um, but the um, the conversation um, uh, really sort of teaches me that it's hard to talk about these things in the abstract. And I think that we've done a really good job so far as we can. And I think that Mr. Laird has done a wonderful job putting together a plan for us. Uh, and I appreciate board members sort of input um, on their own sort of what, where they prefer to be in the process and how, and I think that we need to see um, we need to see what we're working with, um, and then we can revisit if it looks like we need to um, add some additional color or detail to that. Um, Mr. Sultani, did did you want to say something? I did just real okay. briefly, um, and I agree with uh, all the points that Chairperson Urban made. Um, I want to just respond to this concept of you know baked in even wet concrete and july you know the, the it's a real fact you know i, I would just uh, urge the board to consider the process um uh phil implement or phil uh, mr laird suggested only that we will get an opportunity to visit this in january so after january 9th we'll see the the current proposed budget um will be available uh, uh in detail to the board uh, assuming Department of Finance gets their um, systems working. Um, and we will then have an opportunity then to then discuss any considerations at whatever level the board think appropriate. And then there's this opportunity, as Mr. Laird pointed out, of the May revise, where where, where the um, additional, in the spring, additional changes and updates to the, the budget are made at that time before it goes to the legislature. And, and then we appear in front of the legislature to um, kind of with uh, Department of Finance um, to make these uh, proposals to the legislature for approval. So I think we could give it a test run um, starting not July, but starting as early as um, January, figure out if that level of detail that we get into in January and then subsequently the following spring and then July are at the level that the board feel appropriate. And if not, then we can starting in, in, in July again, 
um, you know, uh, starting after that July meeting, then recalibrate for a deeper level if the board chooses so. So I think we're going to get a real shot to try it, and I would you know, perhaps give us a shot. It's only been a factor of how we've come up that that we um, haven't had those opportunities to do that just yet. But I hope moving forward, now that we have the staffing to engage the board, including um, in January, uh, after you know, sometime after the in January when the um, the RBCP is public, a proposed BCP is public. Hope that made sense. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Um, I thought Mr. McTaggart was talking about January. We pour the concrete in July. The concrete is wet in January. That was my understanding. But in any case, thank you. And that makes sense to me. Mr. McTaggart. Yeah, Madam Chair, that's exactly, that was my my thing. But I think we'll, we'll walk and, and then run. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm comfortable with this. I'd like to just ask a separate question, which is about funding. Um, and I, I, my understanding now is that the potentially we're not using sort of what I would call the state CPI level for uh, increasing the funding to the agency. We're using some lesser uh, rate. And I was just wondering uh, if you could expand upon that, uh, either Mr. Sultani or Mr. Lair, because the statute is pretty clear. The statute doesn't say, by the way, please use this artificially lower rate that we, the state, have negotiated with uh, uh a particular union. So I'm just wondering what what where we're getting the authority to use this, as I understand, it, much lower uh, CPI. That's a that's potentially hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars less for our agency. Thank, thanks for that question. I can take it on Phil if you'd like to. Um, to uh, um, I should ask Madam Chair if it's okay. I'll take it and then Phil can jump in if if appropriate. Great. Uh, so, um, so yeah. So, as I mentioned in my update, we requested a 2.5 percent cost of living adjustment um, as required by state agencies. This is this adjustment is um, the personnel adjustment that is negotiated with uh, individual um, bargaining units via a, a MOU, um, and that is something we kind of do automatically and are required to as a state agency. Separately, with regards to a larger um, Kind of cost of living adjustment as outlined in our statute, uh, which is what I believe Mr. McTaggart is referring to. Um, we I have discussed this, uh, and you know, um, and as CPPA worked with Department of Finance in building the 23-24 budget, um, particularly as our projected budget still falls below our statutory allocation, and that the state is projected to have a 25 billion dollar shortfall this year. We determined that it was not necessarily uh, needed at this time. Um, this is an area that we could certainly request a, a, a larger adjustment, including for back years to adjust for inflation. Uh, but that would require a BCP to request funds in excess of our statutory allocation. And if a uh, board prefers to do that, we could certainly take that up when we need to discuss in January, February, or in future years. Um, as I've said in my updates, I've been mindful to stay within our um, statutory allocation as of now uh, to be mindful of our growth and to be mindful of uh, the state's current status. Uh, but I'm certainly expecting that any adjustments be guided by the board and the discussion that we can have by the board. Thank you, Mr. Multani. Multani. I think Mr. McTaggart's point is that our statutory allegation, allocation changes um, according to the formula that's in the statute. And I understand absolutely what you're saying um, with regards to the fact that as we grow, we haven't yet hit the top of our allocation for the statute. So requesting more than what we are actually planning to implement in the BCP might not make sense. But I did want to go back to something that you said just to check. So, um, but if next year, for example, we were going to hit our um, ceiling we would still be able to request based on a ceiling that has been adjusted for the higher inflation this year? We we could very well, uh, um, I'll, I'll respond. We, we could very well request an adjustment for this year and back years based on um, the statute. Um, I will flag that that is, a, that is a change proposal that has to be approved by the Department of Finance, but we would point to our statute as to the justification for that adjustment. Um, often my understanding too is that the um, uh, CPI is often used in relation to personnel services increases that are um, 
uh, sorry, CP, CP, CPI is, uh, is not used with regard to personnel increases. Those are associated, uh, as I said, with the MOUs with individual bargaining units. CPI is often primarily used in relation to fees and services to cover cost increases. And that's where we, we, we come at that. So we would uh, essentially, um, even though it's in statute, need to make a BCP proposal to the Department of Finance and provide a justification for why in order to receive those. It's not automatically done. Okay, thank you. But we wouldn't be leaving money on the table in the future. No. Okay, uh, Mr. McTaggart. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm troubled here because the statute is not doesn't say. By the way, if you think that you're not going to spend it, you don't get it. You don't have to take it. it. Doesn't say if the state's having a bad time, you can sacrifice some of your money. I, I I'm I'm really troubled. It does say that the with respect to the expenditures, we have to go through normal procedures, but there's absolutely nothing. It says hereby appropriated by the people of California to the statute, to the, to the agency. And I'm, you know, the, the, the BLS CPI is like, you know, six for LA. It's, it's way higher than two and a half percent. And I'm, so I'm, I don't know that we have the right to sort of say, we don't want the money or, or and, and, and I, we can always spend the money on, on, for example, public education. That's one of our mandates. So I'm I'm troubled, and I don't think it's our. I really want to actually not um, get in this situation where we're sort of not taking what is our due. We we the, the people of California appropriated that money, uh, all of it, um, and so I think it's not a question of whether the Department of Finance wants to give it to us or not. I mean, this is just the same thing as some you know school bond or something that has to get paid, and you have to owe the interest on it. This is not a discretionary payment uh by 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 anybody this is this is absolutely our 100 percent of this at the california cpi needs to come to us so i i'm i'm i really don't want to have a supplemental i don't want to I, I i think we need to go back and say this is our money pay it please uh because it was appropriated in by nine and a half million californians uh thank you mr mctaggart mr lay yeah i mean i, I think that's a good point um and i i wonder though you know the 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 adjustment sets a minimum for the agency but i think there there is an argument to be made that you know uh as the responsibilities of the agency grows in perhaps res in response to additional legislation uh do we as an agency have the ability to go beyond the 10 million plus the uh, cpi adjustment um you know, beyond what the statute orders. So I think I think the way that we're playing it right now, it, it can go both ways. Like we're taking less than perhaps we um, are entitled to, but in the future, does that give us the flexibility to get more uh, as, you know, the responsibilities of the agency increases um, beyond what the statute had contemplated as the budget? So I'm just curious around that, uh, if there is a, an advantage to taking less now, but taking more as needed, um, perhaps more than we would be entitled to under the statute. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, so I think that this is probably something that staff should take the time to put together and brief us on um, when we pick up the budget again. And the reason why is because I have an inkling and I'm afraid that I'll say the wrong thing without sufficient information behind me. But my understanding is that we've got more than one thing going on here. So we have the fact that we have, as Mr. McTaggart has pointed out, an allocation, a statutory allocation of $10 million a year um, plus the formula for inflation. And that is allocated to us, um, as Mr. McTaggart noted, by the people of California. At the same time, just as the board has to provide oversight of the agency's expenditures, the legislature provides oversight of the agency's expenditures, and the Department of Finance is a con our control agency um, providing oversight and actually um, approving our spending plan. So while this is probably um, not completely intuitive, and this is why I'm afraid, so I'm just going to say I may be wrong about this, and this is why I would like a briefing, because it's my memory um, from last year when we were getting started is that nothing releases us from having to um, submit a budget change proposal every year um, and as needed. 
and having those oversight processes happen. And there is no mechanism, and it is not the mechanism that that annual money goes into our fund or that we can roll it over. That's why before our very first board meeting, I made the kind of executive decision that thankfully everybody agreed with um, because of the, the, the timing to take almost $4 million that we weren't going to be able to spend in that fiscal year and put it into the real estate fund because that's one of the few ways that you can um, roll over um, money. Um, otherwise, um, there isn't a mechanism for that to happen. So there's both the what is allocated from the general fund and then there is actually the mechanism for being allowed to spend it with oversight. And I may have gotten some of that wrong. So what I would really like to do is to agenda that discussion of the public BCP as planned in Mr. Laird's um, recommended process. And as part of that, um, to ask staff to help us really sort of drill down and understand this process. Um, because I really hear what Mr. McTaggart is saying. And I wanna be sure that we have full information about all the different processes and control um, and controls um, that are in place um, that aren't always sort of visible um, immediately. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. McTaggart. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I, again, I just wanted to just address uh, a couple of points. And, and what Mr. Lay said, you know, I sure, and I have always, hoped that we will eventually be such a dynamic agency that the state says yes we you look at the work that you're doing you're you, you know you need to 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 have even more because at some level a notion of a 10 million dollar whatever now with inflation should be over 11 uh uh agency to 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 regulate you know such a huge area is we're going to need to get bigger eventually but that that's in the legislature's wisdom but the minimum i kind of always had felt was going to be there and again, I don't, as a board, I don't know that we have the right in the statute to say, by the way, we don't, we don't want this money. We, you know, we're not going to ask for all of it. it. I completely agree with the chair's uh, point that, of course, that the agency uh, is subject to the legislative oversight for spending. But in terms of taking it, I think we have a fiduciary responsibility to ask for exactly what we're owed. And the other thing that worries me is, you know, the way these things work is now you take a two and a half percent next year your inflation is off that lower base and and you lose just it's like compounding money you lose so much money over 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 decades if you if you don't ask for the maximum every single year and so i would urge mr laird when you come back to us in january we should do a catch up to make sure or you know to the extent that we didn't take all inflation last year we need to be hitting that the the, the new number because this is uh, going to be vital as we as we seek to support the agency's uh, efforts and goals thank you mr mctaggart um, I'm not sure there is a mechanism to move money from the general fund unless we have an actual specific plan to spend it. But again, I really understand what you're saying. And I, I think that um, your suggestion um, for uh, Mr. Laird, Mr. Sultani, whoever is the right person um, to help us sort of through this so that we can figure out the best course forward um, when we take up our discussion of the BCP um, makes a whole lot of sense. Um, Mr. Lay? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with Mr. McTaggart. I, I think we we definitely, the minimum, the amount that the agency should receive, uh, we should be able to calculate that according to the formula in the statute. Uh, and if if our spending needs do, do reach that amount, uh, and, you know, DOF, whoever says that that's, you, you don't, aren't entitled to that, I think we have a strong argument to say no, by statute, if we calculate 10 million inflation under this formula over the past couple of years, this is the minimum amount we're entitled to. Uh, and again, you know, if we don't have a plan to spend it, um, you know, perhaps we we should to figure out a plan to to spend that full amount. Um, I, I imagine once we're fully staffed up, that won't be a problem. Um, and I'll just I'll just say I, I second the the idea that um, we you know we can get further briefing on this, and I, I am a little bit more familiar with California's budgeting process. And um, you know, as as far as Chair Urban said, I, I yeah, if we don't have the plan, the state's just going to take it back. Uh, they're not going to let us take the extra money. But I do think we should establish the the exact minimum amount the agency's entitled to each year, uh, based off the formula, 
And, you know, should our needs reach that amount or go beyond that amount? I think we have a strong argument that the agency is entitled to at least that much. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. De La Troy? Thank you. Um, I just want to add that I, um, I really appreciate the conversation that is being had. I was not completely aware of how we were um, managing the budget and the fact that we were maybe requesting less than it was due. Um, and um, I just want to remind all of us that we are in the process of appointing a new board member. This conversation, if it moves towards um, permanent processes, should welcome the voice of that new board member. So I will encourage our chair to calendar that uh, follow-up conversation at a time where that new board member can participate. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. All right. Um, again, I greatly appreciate the robust discussion um, and I appreciate staff's um, careful help in helping us all understand the intricacies here. Um, what I would like to do is give staff the um, clear understanding that they can proceed based on the process that Mr. Laird set out um, with the guidance of the conversation today. As I mentioned earlier, we heard color um, from different board members that give an indication um, to the kinds of things that they would like to see. Um, and, uh, and we've also heard from all of the board that we want to understand the allocation process more um, so that we can direct the appropriate approach to that um, with a strong um, baseline fundamental understanding uh, that the agency has a responsibility um, to to obtain and use the money that it was allocated by the people of California for the purposes the people of California um, has uh, asked the board or has asked the agency um, to, to fulfill. Uh, so with that, um, what I would like is um, a motion to adopt the process for board input into an oversight of the agency's budget outlined in the memorandum provided by Mr. Laird for our discussion today as informed by today's board discussion. I can make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Do I have a second, please? Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Right. Verbal now. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. It is this problem with we can see one another, but sometimes it's just audio for others. So thank you, Mr. McTaggart, for verbally um, uh, affirming your second. Mr. Sabo, um, uh, is there any public comment? There is one hand raised uh, for Beth Magnuson. So, oh, there's no longer a hand raised. Uh, if anyone would like to make a comment, please go ahead and raise your hand at this time uh, using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Again, if you'd like to speak at this time, please use Zoom's raise hand feature or press star nine if you're joining by phone today. I'm not seeing any hands raised, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo, and thank you again to the board um, for its careful oversight and this robust discussion. Um, Mr. Sabo, could you please call the vote? So the motion is to uh, uh, to adopt the motion as stated by the chair, board member De La Torre. Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board member Lay. Aye. Lay, aye. Board member McTaggart. Aye. McTaggart, aye. Chair Urban. Aye. Urban, aye. And with that, the motion carries four to zero. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, the motion has carried with a vote of four to zero. Mr. Laird, thank you so much for your work on this. Mr. Sultani, um, thank you for your work on this. And I know there are more people behind the scenes and I thank all of them as well. And we will look forward to continuing the conversation um, when we um, uh, discuss that first prong, um, which is the, the January, um, what, you, what you, I think very jauntily, the Jan, the Jan, the Jan BCP. <laughs> um, uh, so we will, we will look forward to that. 
Uh, now we have a bit of a, um, a pause point. Uh, what I would like to do is um, move to the next agenda item and invite Ms. Mahoney to present her first agenda item. But um, we could also take a break now. So we could take a break now or we could take a break after discussing the next agenda item. And I would just like to um, hear folks' preferences. Yes, Ms. De La Torre. I would appreciate the break now. Okay, wonderful. Um, how long do you need? 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or, or a little more like an early lunch? I will say we should make it 20 or 30 minutes to give everybody an opportunity to have an early lunch and so that we don't have to adjourn, but I welcome the feedback from others. All right. Um, does anyone have a, um, does that present challenges for anyone? All right. Um, with that, let's take a break until 11.30 a.m. Um, for members of the public, the board will be removing themselves from the meeting in order to take a break. I believe um, the Zoom will remain open um, so you can walk away if you'd like or not. And Mr. Sabo will um, announce when, when we return, but we can expect that at 11.30. Thanks very much. We are now on break. Welcome back, everyone. We'll give um, Mr. McTaggart and Mr. Lay a second to rejoin us. Welcome back, Mr. Lay. Welcome back, Mr. McTaggart. Thanks everyone. The, this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is now returning from break at 11.31 a.m. And we are um, beginning agenda item number six on the agenda. Agenda item number six will be presented by Ms. Maureen Mahoney, our Deputy Director of Policy and Legislation. Welcome to the meeting today, Ms. Mahoney. Ms. Mahoney will be providing us an update on legislative developments that are relevant to the agency or its work and discussing a recommended process for considering legislation. If the board will please turn its attention to the materials for agenda item number six, you'll find a memorandum from Ms. Mahoney outlining the California legislative process and some recommendations for an expected process for legislative work. Uh, as a reminder to Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay and for Mr. McTaggart's um, background, we followed a version of this process, the version that would apply when there is a short fuse on taking a legislative position in July of this past year when we considered the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. Ms. Mahoney has developed a recommendation that also allows us to have a regular plan and process aligned with the regular legislative calendar. Uh, Ms. Mahoney, thank you again for being here and for applying your expertise to put this together for us. And I will turn things over to you. Thank you, Chairperson and members of the board for the opportunity to provide a legislative update. I'm planning to cover three main topics in today's update. I'll start first with an overview of notable California legislation that was signed into your by, Gov 
signed this year by Governor Newsom, uh, then turn to active federal legislation, and then finally go over staff's recommended processes for taking legislative positions and making legislative proposals. This should be about a five minute overview. First, with respect to California, children's privacy and reproductive privacy were a focus for California lawmakers this past year. No bills significantly impacting the agency's duties were ultimately signed into law, but notable privacy bills were adopted, several of which I will briefly go over. The first is AB 2273, the California Age Appropriate Design Code, which among other provisions, restricts a cover business from collecting, selling, sharing, or retaining any personal information that's not necessary to provide an online product, uh, service, or feature with, with, a, with which a child defined as under 18 is actively and knowingly engaged unless the business can demonstrate a compelling reason that is in the best interest of the child. The bill creates the California Children's Data Protection Working Group, which we will discuss in more detail in another agenda item. And I also want to flag that this newly adopted law is a subject of a court challenge. NetChoice has filed suit against the California Attorney General's Office, which is responsible mm -hmm. for enforcing the law, to enjoin enforcement of the AADC and invalidate it on several grounds, including the First Amendment, which we will be watching closely. Second, SB 1172, the Student Test Taker Privacy Protection Act, requires that a business providing proctoring services in an educational setting collect, use, retain, and disclose only the personal information that's strictly necessary to provide those services. And third, with respect to reproductive privacy, AB 1242 by Assemblymember Bauer Cahan, among other provisions, prevents out of state law enforcement entities from obtaining information from California companies about an abortion that would be legal in California. That's an urgency measure that's already, into, that's already gone into effect. So that concludes my overview of notable California privacy legislation. I'll now turn to federal legislation that agency staff is actively tracking. Uh, so first is an update on the American Data Privacy Protection Act or ADPPA. Um, as you know, the agency board voted unanimously in July to oppose this bill as currently drafted as it could significantly weaken California's privacy protections by seeking to preempt nearly all the provisions of the California Consumer Privacy Act and other state privacy laws. There's also a lot of discussion surrounding privacy legislation and whether any legislation will be added to a must pass bill, uh, such as the omnibus spending bill by the end of this year. ADPPA supporters are continuing to push for passage, though we understand that there are concerns in both houses about the bill in its current form. That said, there will be changes in the composition of the House next year, so the political dy dynamics will shift. Other legislation that's under discussion um, has to do with kids' privacy, for example, Senators Blumenthal and Blackburn's Kids Online Safety Act, which as it advanced out of the Senate Commerce Committee this summer, requires covered platforms to act in the best interest of minors and to provide consumer-friendly tools for managing the online experience of minors. Another bill that passed Senate Commerce uh, mark of the summer is an update to the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, otherwise known as COPA, uh, Senators Marky and Cassidy's Children and Teen Online Privacy Protection Act, informally known as COPA 2.0, that as reported out of committee extends COPA's opt-in to data collection requirement to minors 13 through 16 and prohibits targeted advertising to children under 13, among other provisions. And then finally, we're also monitoring the National Defense Authorization Bill, uh, language that would allow federal judges and their family members to take down from the internet uh, public display information such as their addresses and license plate numbers is in the bill that advanced out of the legislature and is headed to President Biden for his consideration. And then third, uh, legislative processes. So staff in a memo that's included in the meeting materials for this agenda item, uh, recommends steps for first taking a position on legislation, both state and federal, and second for the agency to make legislative proposals following, um, overall following the steps the agency has already taken in voting to oppose the ADPPA in its current form. So first I'd like to note that staff is not proposing any legislative requests this year. Our top priority has been on the regulations. Um, also with respect to timing, staff suggests planning on two regular board meetings um, a year, one in November or December to consider legislative proposals and one in midsummer to consider active legislation, recognizing that legislative questions may come up that require additional discussion as well. 
Next, with respect to the agency taking a position on legislation, first as an initial matter, I want to clarify that for the agency to take a formal position, support, oppose, etc., the board has to vote on that in a public meeting. Um, and our recommended process for doing so is that staff will monitor bills, provide updates to the board. Of course, the board is free to flag legislation for staff at any time to monitor. And for bills that affect the agency, staff will analyze them, prepare a short memo, which may recommend taking a position for discussion at a board meeting. If the board votes to take a position, staff will communicate that position to stakeholders in the public as we did with ADPPA. In terms of proposing legislation in California, likewise to propose legislation on behalf of the agency, the board needs to vote at a public meeting. Board members um, and staff can uh, suggest proposals to me at any time. Um, board members can certainly do so at, at um, board meetings as well. Staff will analyze proposals in the fall, um, bring them forward at that time for the board's consideration, uh, which will be outlined in a brief public memo. And again, if the board approves a proposal, staff will communicate it to the legislature and other interested agencies and provide updates on status. And we think these steps will enable the board to make informed decisions about legislation affecting the agency, to enable all board members to have meaningful input into the legislative decision-making process and enable staff to respond to quickly moving legislation in a timely and effective manner. Uh, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Mahoney. Um, comments or questions from the board? Ms. De La Torre? Um, I just wanted to make sure that I understand. So we're talking about two meetings a year of the board where there will be an agenda item related to legislative policy. Is that the proposal? Um, Ms. Mahoney? I mean, my understanding is that would be a regular schedule to anticipate and respond to the regular legislative calendar. And then, of course, things can come up like the ADPPA came up over the summer. Is that correct? Correct. So, you know, one of staff's goals was to provide board members with some expectation in terms of timing um, so that board members, um, as proposed, could expect to have a meeting, you know, perhaps in midsummer to consider active legislation and then another meeting in the fall to consider proposals for legislation. But certainly there's a lot of flexibility in there. Um, you know, things could come up at any time and the board, you know, may need to to may want to convene to, to consider them. Thank you. Um, I, I have a similar comment to the comment that I had in the prior um, uh, agenda item, which is we, we're missing one member of the board and somebody is going to be appointed, I imagine, in the near future. So I think that this conversation should have with the benefit of that additional member my understanding is for the um, Fair Political Practices Board, they do have two um, permanent um, subcommittees. And one is um, helping with the, the uh, with the, uh, I'm sorry, with the uh, agency priorities and budget. And the other one is around this topic of legislative policy. And I think that we should consider whether that will be a helpful addition to the proposal uh, of Mrs. Mahoney to just enable the board to um, engage with the agency in a way that doesn't necessarily take a lot of time out of the regular scheduled board meetings, um, particularly next year, as we would likely be considering uh, um, regulatory package that will have to be um, brought to the board, um, on, I, I imagine, on multiple occasions for conversations. Um, so uh, again, I, I think that if we can maybe um, take the advice that we have received for, from the staff at this point, but with the understanding that maybe we can have a follow-up conversation next year once we have the new member and consider um, other possibilities on how to best engage. I'm, I don't have enough awareness on the volume of the proposals that we might see that affect us, but I know that you know from history, we, we had had a significant number of uh, proposals related to privacy in prior years. 
So I'm just thinking about how we can best engage with the agency in a way that doesn't take a lot of time of the you know, general board meeting, but at the same time um, can be um, effective and helpful. And looking at other agencies that have similar mandates, I think is a, is a, is a good uh, practice. Um, thank you, Ms. De La Torre, um, and I appreciate your, your thoughts. Um, so I had in my little hopper of, you know, planned um, stage uh, discussions um, to discuss uh, subcommittees and process when we have the new board member in place, as you discussed. We've had, of course, we have two dearly departed um, board members. We have um, a newer welcome board member, Mr. McTaggart, and we will have another one. So it's a timely um, place to discuss that. Um, I did want to clarify for my, so I have this correct as I'm thinking it through um, how to, you know, sort of structure information for a discussion. When you are thinking about this, um, the role of the subcommittee cannot be to take a position on legislation or um, to to agree to propose legislation. The board, the entire board, has to vote on those things. Um, so, what would be the role? Well, I don't. Um, I don't want to. You kind of prejudge the conversation, we should all participate in the conversation. I think there is a wide range of possibilities. If it's an advisory board, which is what we have done in the past, it wouldn't necessarily be uh, um, an advisory subcommittee. I'm sorry, that it, that's what we, we have done in the in the past. It, it wouldn't really function in any decision-making capacity. I don't know if given the possibility that there might be an urgency in, you know, providing feedback, there is a um, situation where we might create a board that is not advisory in nature. And if that was the, uh, I apologize, I'm making this mistake again, uh, a subcommittee that is not advisory in nature, but a subcommittee that's a decision-making subcommittee, we've never done that. So I don't know what the, what the range of possibilities will be in terms of what could be delegated to that subcommittee to make a decision maybe around um, you know, initial feedback. I, I think that it's worth a conversation. That's what I'm trying to say. And, and that, I, I think that we should look at the a range of possibilities and how we can best utilize those to better um, have a, a policy um, discussion at the board member that informs the positions of the agency. Okay. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. That is that's helpful sort of background um, uh, um, on on your on your thinking there. Um, as with the budget proposal, I don't think that is intention necessarily with what Ms. Mahoney has proposed. Um, does everyone does, is everyone on board with the thought that we um, will? have um, a process by which anyone can propose things to Ms. Mahoney so that she has the information necessary. And we will expect to take this up on um, a general schedule. Um, but of course, like if, if as Ms. De La Torre pointed out, there's an emergency that pushes it, then you know, staff will help us make um, decisions uh, at that time. And if there's a, a, there's a legislation that comes up that is urgency, then of course, um, staff will, uh, will let us know so that we could consider it the way we did over the summer. But the general sort of framework of the proposal um, makes a lot of sense to me. And I'm hoping to check in with board members on that um, with the appreciation for Ms. De La Torre's um, thoughts about um, more sort of more detailed process potentially with the subcommittee once we have a, a new board member. I'm sorry, Mr. Laird, I saw you pop in just a little bit late. Um, was there something that you needed to say? No, no I was just uh, prepared if there was further questions about oh, sort of subcommittee okay. dynamics. Yes, no, and I, um, I appreciate and agree with Ms. De La Torre's thought that um, we should sort of talk about that in a structural way um, when we have it agendized, but I appreciate the sort of background that she's given. I think I now have the information that I need. Um, so anyway, further thoughts on the, the general um, sort of broad legislative process. Okay. 
Um, thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. Um, and again, so staff um, are clear that we've we've heard this and they've heard us. May I have a motion to adopt the process for considering and proposing legislation that is outlined in the memorandum provided by Ms. Mahoney for our discussion today? Again, informed as informed by today's discussion. To move. I still move. Second. <laughs> okay, thank you. Ms. De La Torre has moved and Mr. McTaggart has seconded. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Savo, is there public comment? Uh, if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand at this time using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Again, if you'd like to speak under public comment at this time, go ahead and raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Ted Harrington. Uh, you'll be uh, unmuted and given three minutes to make your comment. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, sorry, and this is this is circling back to this isn't what we were just talking about. But in terms of the CPRA, you know, people are talking about wet cement and dry cement and all that. Um, in terms of it going effective January 1st, does that mean to be compliant? We have to have all the new links up for do not share and you know all the other requirements under the CPRA, or is that something that will wait until the, I think the implementing regs are adopted? I'm just not clear on when we have to have to actually, you know, have all the links up and be operationally compliant with the CPRA. Thank you very much. Um, and I know staff are going to work to be sure the website is clear on all the different dates. Um, any other public comment, Mr. Salva? Again, if you'd like to make a comment at this time, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Okay, Sarah Healy, I'm gonna unmute you now and you'll have three minutes to make your comment. Thank you for the board and all the information you're delivering. It's very, very helpful. Um, I have a question about the B2B and employee exemptions. Is that going to be lifted um, under CCP, old regs, CCPA, January 1? Or is that also uh, sidelined for now? Uh, thank you, Sarah Healy, for the question and the comment. Um, we are not able to respond in detail uh, in the public meeting, but I'm going to just ask um, staff to um, hear the substance of um, Sarah Healy's comments. And again, I know staff are working to make sure the website is going to be clear about the different dates. Thank you very much. But next, we have AJ. AJ, you will have three minutes, um, which I will begin timing once you speak. Hi, folks. Um, not so much a comment, but just hoping it, if it would be possible for Ms. Mahoney to restate which uh, California bills uh, the agency is considering really briefly. I apologize for that. Uh, thank you, AJ. We're not considering any bills at the moment. Ms. Mahoney was giving us an update on things that had happened that are relevant to the agency's subject matter. Are those bills that have, that have been introduced before the legislature this year, is that what those items were? Yes. I believe, okay. I believe they've all been passed. Is that right, Ms. Mahoney? Correct. So I provided an update on California legislation uh, that was signed by uh, Governor Newsom this past year. Um, and then I provided a uh, brief update on active uh, federal legislation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If anyone uh, else 
Oh, apologies. <laughs> oh, if there is anyone else who'd like to make a comment, please go ahead and raise your hand at this time using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. This is for public comment for agenda item six, legislative policy and update. Okay, Madam Chair, I am not seeing other hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sabo. In that case, we'll circle back to Mr. McTaggart. Mr. McTaggart, please go ahead. Thanks. I just, um, you know, uh, in an effort to be sort of consumer friendly here, we had a couple of questions there, and just kind of one question I think is a uh, was a was a reasonable question. I just think of you know an answer we can give because that's just the facts. This is about the employer employee and the B two B. You know, those provisions expired, uh, and the legislature did not see fit to uh, amend them. And so, as a board, you know, uh, I would just say that they're not in in, in position now, not in uh, not in effect uh, after the legislature did not amend them. Um, so, I just, you know, sometimes people ask questions, and I just kind of thought we I want to answer them. So, thank you, Mr. McTiger. Uh, Mr. Sabo, um, could you please call the vote? Yes, the motion is to adopt uh, the board policy, legislative policy and update item uh, as moved by board member De La Torre and seconded by board member McTaggart. Board member De La Torre. Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board member Lay. Aye. Lay, aye. Board member McTaggart. Aye. McTaggart, aye. Chair Urban. Aye. Urban, aye. And with that, Madam Chair, the motion carries four to zero. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo, and thank you, members of the board, uh, and Ms. Mahoney for all your work on this. Um, the motion carries with a vote of four to zero. And with that, we will move to agenda item number seven, which is a discussion of the process um, for appointing members to the California Children's Data Protection Working Group. Ms. Mahoney is also going to um, present this item. And you will find a memorandum with background on the recently passed California Age Appropriate Design Code Act and the recommended process for um, the CPPA's appointments to the working group uh, in your agenda materials, or sorry, your materials for today under agenda item number seven. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney, um, for putting this together for us, and please go ahead. Thank you, Chairperson, members of the board. Uh, the California Age Appropriate Design Code, which will go into effect on January 1st, 2023, creates the California Children's Data Protection Working Group, which is tasked with submitting a report to the legislature every two years beginning January 1st, 2024 until January 1st, 2030, that makes recommendations on best practices regarding children's access to online services, products, and features. Um, also note that one of the areas on which the working group is directed to make a recommendation is, quote, how the working group in the Department of Justice may leverage the substantial and growing expertise of the California Privacy Protection Agency in the long-term development of data privacy policies that affect the privacy rights and safety of children online, end quote. Uh, the CPBA has two appointments to the working group, and working group members are required to be Californians with expertise in at least two of the following areas, and I'll read them now. Uh, children's data privacy, physical health, mental health and well-being, computer science, and children's rights. So there's no deadline for appointing members to the working group, but the first report is due no later than January 1st, 2024, and appointments could begin as early as January 1st, 2023, the effective date of the bill. Staff recommends that the board delegate to the executive director the authority to appoint the working group members. This will allow for a more thorough and candid processing. And if the board does make such a delegation, we recommend that the board provide general guidance as to the minimum two required qualifications from the list that I just read that successful candidates should possess, as well as any other relevant experience to prioritize and a general time frame by which to complete the appointments. And I'm happy to answer any questions and our general counsel, Mr. Phil Laird, is here to answer questions as well. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. Um, I have a couple of thoughts, but I will hold them and ask first if there are thoughts from other members of the board.
Mr. McTaggart, please go ahead. Um, yeah, and sorry, it is, is the proposal to give delegate to the director the appointment power with a return to the board to confirm the appointment, uh, you know, recommendations? You know, I, I guess I would be comfortable with giving the director the power to, you know, make the recommendations and then bring it back to the board to approve. I don't, is that the proposal? Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. I think the proposal was um, to delegate to the executive director the ability to appoint the board members. And, and I guess, can um, I ask, is there any issue if, you know, because I understand, obviously, it's easier to do this uh, um, from a procedural point of view, uh, if the director has some, some flexibility to do that, but is there anything to, you know, stop the director coming back with the recommendation for the two people and that would just essentially be an agenda item that we could look I, I do think that's a might, might be a nice way of uh splitting the baby so to speak you know giving the responsibility but allowing us to have the oversight uh thank you mr mctaggart and your thought would be that it would be something like um a senate confirmation where there's one appointee for each slot my my worry would just be I don't want people to be subjected to some kind of interview no, no, sorry, that was, public. Um, that's not my, that's sorry, that's, but you're thinking like you're thinking like advice and consent from the Senate kind of thing. Yeah, this I wasn't thinking. Yeah. That, I, I wasn't thinking. Literally, I was thinking that the director would come back and say, you know, Ms. Brown and and Mr. Brown are the two people. Uh, uh, you know, I've 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 selected here are their resumes, here are their qualifications. They've agreed to do it, and we'd say great. I just that's a, be a nice way of us having a little bit of oversight, but um, I see. Okay, okay, thank you, uh, Mr. McTaggart. So let's go ahead and have um, the flavor that is in the memo and the second flavor um, that is proposed by Mr. McTaggart, sort of on the table as we discuss. Ms. De La Torre, um, I was just going to uh, mention, I, I think that what Mr. McTaggart says will give us an opportunity to meet um, the appointees and also express our support for their appointment, which I think will be, both things will be positive. Something that obviously is not an interview, um, Mr. Mrs. Urban mentioned this, um, I think it's really important. Um, these position as I understand it is not a compensated position. Anybody who volunteers for, for it is actually going to basically donate their time to the state of California. And um, you, we should be you know, very supportive and, and very welcoming of um, the appointments that I'm sure will be made by staff in uh, the most you know, um, beneficial way. Um, but something that's a little bit more symbolic, that is just bringing the appointees to meet the board and, and for the board to just concur with the appointment, I think it will, it will have value. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Oh, further? You have further to say, Ms. Oh, no. no. Okay. No. Um, all right. Mr. Lay. Yeah, I, I think meeting the um, the appointees is a good idea. So, um, you know, I think Mr. McTaggart's suggestion is a good one. We can kind of split the baby in a way that, uh, yeah, prevents, you know, hiccups and uh, delays and, you know, doing public uh, interviews and, and, and things like that. And uh, yeah, still give us a chance to try that oversight, meet the meet the um, the working group appointees and uh, yeah, just give the blessing. Thank you, Mr. Lay. All right. Um, I also had uh, some thoughts on the advice to the executive director with regards to the criteria for the working group members. Um, I have in mind in part Ms. De La Torre's observation that the working group members will be providing a great service to the state of California. It's a fairly complicated job. Um, and rather than choose among that list um, and tell the executive director to maximize two things out of that list, I think that I would prefer um, to just understand that the executive director and staff will be referring to the list um, when looking at candidates 
and taking any additional guidance the board might have um, when looking to candidates. And I have one piece of additional guidance, which for the reasons that I that I just stated, I'm not saying that I um, want to impose an additional requirement, but I think that um, looking to um, potential working group members experience and expertise that would allow them to have some insight into different concerns and different issues for children from some of the many diverse communities we have in California who have different forms of marginalization and privilege and being able to take that into account effectively for all the children of California um, would be something I would really value in a candidate. So if staff could take that um, information from me, I would appreciate that. Um, Ms. De La Torre? I just want to echo your words on that point. I, I think that uh, it will be a disservice for us to identify two areas. First of all, because we don't know the pool of candidates and it's very difficult to anticipate, you know, there might be value in a candidate that maybe doesn't, you know, meet the two criteria that we can select right now. Um, and, and the second piece of it is that my hope is that the board as a whole will be balanced, which means to me that to the extent that um, our executive director might have awareness of the candidates that are going to be appointed by the other appointing authorities, maybe we can seek the candidate that brings to the mix um, expertise on mental health and well-being, because the other candidates maybe um, that are being considered or appointed don't necessarily have that. Uh, so my recommendation and my suggestion will be for the board to just ask, um, delegate to the executive director as it was um, proposed, um, have that opportunity to meet the selected appointees and, and bless the, the uh, appointment and leave the executive director the ability to identify which of these are best suited to create a board that as a whole is balanced. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, I certainly align myself with um, Ms. De La Torre's further um, suggestion as well. Mr. Lay? Yeah, uh, both of the suggestions are great. And, you know, not to pick out any one criteria, but, um, you know, I, I do think a focus on mental health and well-being is is uh, is a big one. Um, I, you know, I am concerned around the use of, you know, uh, certain data practices that kind of can can really shape young children's minds and kind of, you know, short circuit reward systems and uh, kind of create long term uh, cognitive issues and focus issues. So, uh, you know, not to say any, <clears throat> any of those five, you know, we, we don't consider, but, you know, I think a priority for me would be a candidate, if not already represented in other working group members that that is, um, you know, understands those those mental health issues uh, for for youth and um, definitely second the idea is that you know this is a very intersectional issue so understanding it from different perspectives uh, you know children from different racial backgrounds different income backgrounds uh, will be important thank you mr lay um, and i know you love all of your criteria equally <laughs> um, sorry to make a children's joke i mean and not to make light at all of the very serious um, mental health um, concerns. I agree with Mr. Lay and Ms. De La Torre that that um, is very prominent uh, uh, in my mind as well. Um, any other firmer, further comment from the board? Yes, Mr. McTaggart. Sorry, just because other people gave them, I, I would just say to the director also, I think the, the um, especially around younger women, the sort of the addictive nature of some of these platforms that, that show you know, uh, and you know, artificial views of other people, and 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 I just, you know, in terms of self body image, are just really devastating for the young for young girls. So just maybe, you know, people who have an expertise in that area would be good. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, Ms. Mahoney and uh, Mr. Sultani, do you have um, information that would help you? Um, if so, I will um, work to formulate a motion that takes into account everything we've discussed. Can I make one suggestion? Um, and I appreciate the board's input. I think this is wonderful. And I have, I think the idea to meet the candidate is a, is a good one and provide concurrence. Can I, um, and, and I'd like to get the board's input if, um, 
if it's okay to just provide an invitation to the candidate, but allow if some doesn't if someone doesn't want to appear in front of the public or the board, um, just for for any reason, if that would be okay. Um, so we'll of course bring the names forward and and make it public. But I I, I know some people don't want to necessarily appear on on in public. Can I just actually? To me, that would be a, a red flag. It, this is a public board. This person is going to be operating in, in public. It is a very public profile in the biggest state in the country and an issue that is in front of mind for the whole world right now. So if this person can't appear before us and on board to basically get blessed, that, that, that would be a huge red flag for me. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Uh, yes, Ms. De La Torre? Uh, just quickly, I didn't uh, think about what Mr. McTaggart just mentioned, but it makes a lot of sense to me. But just for my own clarity, so the board itself, the board that we will be appointing these two persons to, is a board that is subject to the same requirements that we are subject in terms of public in, in terms of public meetings. Is that is that correct? Yes, Mr. So it, then it, yeah, it seems to me that 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 person, one of the requirements would be to be comfortable with, um, you know, appearing in public and. In participating in, in board meetings, it, sh it should be a, pre a pre requirement, really. All right. Um, thank you, um, Mr. McTaggart and Ms. De La Torre. That is a, a good point. Um, so I will now formulate a motion and ask Mr. Laird if it is appropriate or if I need to amend it um, and ask the board's patience um, as we get this right. May I have a motion to adopt the process outlined in the memorandum provided by Ms. Mahoney for our discussion today as amended in today's discussion to include um, the executive director's chosen appointments to come before the board uh, for a confirmation process with the expectation that the board will be in, um, introducing themselves um, to the working group members. Pursuant, uh, sorry, I'm going to have to start over because I forgot the name of the working group because I'm doing this on the fly. So please forgive me um, one more time and I'll remember to put the name of the working group in there. May I have a motion to adopt the process outlined in the memorandum provided by Ms. Mahoney for our discussion today as amended in today's discussion to appoint members to the California Children's Data Protection Working Group pursuant to civil code 1798.99.32 and to delegate to the executive director of the California Privacy Protection Agency the authority to appoint those members with the expectation that the executive director will bring the his chosen appointees um, to a future board meeting for confirmation um, and introductions by the board. Mr. Laird, is that okay? I think that I think that will suffice. Absolutely. Okay, I put I put the uh, confirmation at the end, and that made it easier to get through all of the items. All right, may I have a, a motion? Um, so moved. May I have that motion? Thank you, Mr. Lay has moved. May I have a second? I second. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Right. Uh, motion is made and seconded. Um, Mr. Sabo, um, is there any public comment? Members of the public who would like to make a comment at this time, please go ahead and raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. This is public comment related to the agenda item seven. Again, if you'd like to speak on agenda item seven, please raise your hand at this time using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining us by phone. Madam Chair, it doesn't appear as though we have any members of the public wishing to speak this time. All right, thank you, Mr. Sabo. Um, in that case, would you please call the vote? Yes, the motion is that which was stated by the chair. <laughs> Moved by Board Member Lay and seconded by Board Member De La Torre. Board Member De La Torre? Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board Member Lay? Aye. Lay, aye. Board Member McTaggart? Aye. McTaggart, aye. Chair, Tom, uh, Chair Urban? Aye. 
Urban I. And with that, Madam Chair, the vote passes four to zero. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sabo. Um, the motion has carried with a vote of four to zero. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Mahoney and Executive Director Sultani for your work on this. We'll look forward to your appointments um, and meeting them in that future board meeting uh, and for their future work on children's privacy. With that, um, we will now move to agenda item number eight, an update from the new CPRA rules subcommittee. Um, we haven't had a subcommittee update in a bit, so just as a brief background, Bagley Keene allows for subcommittees of two people to act in an advisory capacity for the board. In the June 14th and September 7th and 8th, 2021 meetings, we formed several advisory subcommittees to help us progress towards priorities while staffing was being put in place. Among those were subject matter-based subcommittees to advise the board on the agency's initial rulemaking. The new CPRA rules subcommittee has been working to advise the board on a set of items that are new in the California Consumer Privacy Act with the amendments from the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020. The new CPRA rules subcommittee is Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay. And if they are ready, I will turn it over to them. Great. Thank you, Chair Urban. Um, Mr. Sabo, could you start screen sharing the presentation? Oh, there you go. Um, well, great. And can you go to the next slide? Um, as Chair Urban just mentioned, you know, this is a, you know, a, a broad overview of our assignment for the subcommittee uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. De La Torre and I, and it covers risk assessment, cybersecurity audits, automated decision-making. Um, next slide, please. And, Yes, this is the status update. You know, I'm, I'm going to talk a lot right now, um, so you know, apologies in advance. But yeah, our current status is, you know, our our subcommittee has a working draft of the proposed rules for risk assessments, cybersecurity audits, automated decision making. Um, however, we we have decided to identify topics that would benefit from additional public input. Um, you know, we we reviewed all of the comments that came in before. Um, there are some decision points that we, we thought it would be valuable um, to have more, uh, more, more input because these are complex topics that merit additional feedback, and particularly because California will be one of the first jurisdictions to issue rules on this topic. Um, some of the questions maybe look familiar to you all, but uh, they delve a little bit deeper. Um, There's more spe specificity to them around different frameworks. Um, and that'll help us kind of finalize the rules in our working our working draft. Um, and you know, so the goal of today's presentation to the board is to essentially solicit feedback uh, from the the board um, to help inform our next steps. And you know, the feedback we we would welcome uh, are uh, you know on on the topics we should discuss, the sample questions we provided. And any proposed next steps that you you decide um, you think we should take, um, board. I, I want to note that you know the board can provide feedback to us directly during today's meetings on the questions that we bring up. Um, there is an attachment in uh, the meeting materials. Board members can also provide feedback directly to staff after this meeting, and then um, staff would consolidate that and uh, provide you know, could, could edit the questions and present it to the board for final review. Uh, for today, we want to focus mostly on those proposed topics, the sample questions and next steps. And, um, you know, I, I really recommend that, you know, if there's any feedback you have on the on the questions today, you know, please provide it now, but you, you have time afterwards. Um, and then finally, um, I, I wanted to pull in Ashkan. Uh, the executive director, Mr. Sultani, uh, to kind of discuss the timing for this. You know, I, ideally we'd get this out, uh, you know, these questions out immediately, but there is a stepwise process. Uh, kind of want to get this first rulemaking package completed first before we, you know, dedicate staff resources to, uh, you know, reviewing preliminary comments for, for the, the new rules. Um, but Mr. Sultani, if, if you could provide some uh, timing and update on timing. Um, for us and yeah, Chair Urban, uh, any questions you may have, but. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll wait for Executive Director Sultani because he might actually answer my my question. Um, sure, so in terms of timing, um, I appreciate uh, 
the subcommittee's guidance here and flexibility. Um, uh, staff's opinion was to do this uh, in sequence rather than in parallel with the existing rulemaking to both best manage uh, resources uh, to allow us to finish the existing rulemaking, but also kind of um, try to avoid situations where we have a informal request for comment and a formal uh, comment period open at the same time, as that will um, create not only additional work, but perhaps confusion on the public on the part of the public of where they should uh, direct which comments to. So for that reason, we would expect, given the uh, update I provided about the rulemaking, to do this sometime after uh, the package has been, uh, uh, at the very least, um, provided to OAL, if not approved by OAL. But I'm happy to take direction of the board uh, if, if that's not uh, if it's not ideal. Okay, I still have my question. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director Sultani. I think that I think that I have it, but um, forgive me, I'm just hoping to clarify what this is. Um, and so putting together the materials and my understand of, understanding of our previous processes with the rulemaking package that it is, is nearing completion. My end, what I think is happening is that the appendix with the questions, um, number one, grew at the beginning from answers to questions from the preliminary request for comment that we put out last fall um, that was on all of the potential topics for rulemaking. Then we had a package that was many of those topics, but not the ones that the new CPRA rules subcommittee um, has been working through. Um, so in a separate future package that Mr. Sultani was just that Mr. Sultani just mentioned, that would be the time to take up these topics in a formal rulemaking. And what the subcommittee has provided the expanded questions and um, topics based on their research for today is as input into a new preliminary request for comment. Do I have that right? I'm just trying to get the pictures right. I think that's absolutely right, um, Chairman Urban. We basically are suggesting that we should prepare a new um, preliminary um, comment period, like the one that we worked together to prepare mm -hmm. for the big package. And um, we just have more granular questions. We're hoping to get more um, granular feedback to finalize our working draft. Okay. And so then the thought would be um, that the board um, would provide feedback on the detailed questions um, today, or um, if staff is working to complete it over the, net, the timeline that Mr. Sultani mentioned, then board members would be able to give input to staff. I think that we have to do input today and then input to staff because um, under Bagley Keene, you know, I can't call up Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay and give my input um, right. because I have too many. So right. Too many board no, but, members. So it would have but, to go through the staff. I, am I understanding yep. that? Right? Yeah, for clarity, what we're proposing, what we're presenting here is a draft. After the input that we receive here, we will go into subcommittee. The staff will work on a final version, like the one that we prepared together, uh, Chairman Urban. And our um, plan is to, at that point, release that draft from the subcommittee and allow the staff to reach out to individual members outside of the subcommittee and take any additional input on that document. And that document will be eventually presented to the board to vote to initiate the process like we did last time, it wouldn't come back to subcommittee with the comments of other board members just precisely because of the concerns that you you just raised. So that, that's what we had in mind. Okay, thank you. I understand. And that seems like a great plan to me. I will need more time with this to sort of think um, and compare to um, some background information that I have. Uh, so. I'm not prepared to offer detailed comments on the appendix today, other than to say, I think it's very thoughtfully done. Thank you. Um, I see reflection of the comments that we received previously and thank you for that. Um, but I would like the opportunity to um, spend a little bit more time with it. Um, yeah, absolutely. And and we, we built in time for that. Uh, essentially, you know, this is just your first look at it. You'll be able to provide feedback, not to us, 
but to staff on you know the eventual questions that'll come out uh, in that preliminary rulemaking. Um, and essentially, after this, we're going to actually talk about some of those topics. Um, and and you know you can get more uh, of a picture around some of the issues that uh, our subcommittee has been dealing with, and that that can help inform. Um, yeah, any any input that you can provide, either directly to staff or at another board meeting. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide. And then, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And what we're looking at right now, the three last slides here are really a summary of the draft that has been presented as an additional uh, set of materials. We generated these um, slides just to go over kind of the different uh, bullet level points for risk assessments, cybersecurity audits, and automated decision making um, that you will see in the more detailed draft. There is no need to have a detailed conversation about feedback at this point. We welcome any input, but uh, like we said, we have structured it to give uh, board members time to kind of digest this. Um, see a final version proposed by subcommittee and then uh, engage with agency with any uh, feedback that uh, you individually might have. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and kind of read the slide, the bullet points. Maybe I'll make um, some um, um, mention to things that we want to highlight. Um, and then I, I will pause and see if um, other board members have comments that they want to provide at this time. This first slide reflects a summary of the questions that we are proposing in regards to risk assessments. The first um, bullet point refers to um, the idea of um, uh, bringing to um, the board and the agency awareness around existing legal requirements and compliance processes that might be in place. Um, this uh, will allow us to be aware of the requirements that already exist and Think about whether it makes sense for our rules to align to those existing requirements. Um, the question number two um, is uh, related to considerations that we might uh, want to have in, in regards to communities or individuals that could be more susceptible to harm from data processing practices. Uh, we're hoping that we will have um, participation from um, uh, different organizations that represent the interests of these groups that can give us a more granular understanding of those considerations so that we can bake them into uh, our requirements for risk, risk assessments. The third one relates to the relevant factors for determining when processing presents significant risks to consumers. Uh, one of the uh, things that we need to establish is what is the threshold for an activity to be consider it uh, significantly risky enough to trigger this requirement of a formal assessment. Um, we have considered different approaches that um, are already implemented in other jurisdictions. Among um, those approaches that we have um, considered is the European Data Protection Board um, guidelines on DPIAs, which establish, I think, is nine different criteria. And if you meet two of those criteria, then your um, activities are considered to be high risk. There is a really good presentation that was provided to the board during the uh, preliminary um, uh, activities related to the ongoing rulemaking package. And I will refer um, board members to that presentation for more granular understanding of how, the, how those criteria came to be created in Europe. We're also looking at other jurisdictions uh, such as um, uh, Colorado uh, and their proposed rules around risk assessments. Um, so um, it, what we're seeking is basically feedback on, on what those factors uh, should be. Um, the next one is related to requirements for automated decision-making. And what we're referring to here is that we um, initially are conceiving these risk assessments as inclusive of situations where there could be automated decision-making and there will be a need to identify in those occasions where there's automated decision-making, what are the um, different um, items that we expect to be um, 
address in the formal assessment that are specific to automated decision making. So it's like an overlay um, of requirements on top of the regular requirements that will apply to any activity that is deemed to be of significant risk. Um, the um, next one is what should be the submission model for the risk assessment? Our statute st uh, establishes that the assessment sh should be submitted to the agency. And what we're thinking is whether there's a, a space for not the actual individual assessments, but some form of summary um, and certification to be submitted to the agency that is more, um, is, is, it, it somehow um, reduces the, the burden on organizations, but also is more functional and accessible in terms of how it provides the information for um, our staff. Um, so the last one is considerations in regards to business that, um, that uh, have less than $25 million in annual gross revenues. And that is um, relevant to the idea of whether we should simplify somewhat the requirements for um, small businesses. Um, and again, we welcome um, feedback on that space. I'm gonna pause here. I'm gonna give um, the other board members an opportunity to comment. Uh, like we said before, it's okay if there is no comment at this point, there will be a, a further opportunity for each individual board member to provide input to this initial set of questions. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Mm. I think that's you and me, Mr. McTaggart. <laughs> you have anything or shall we ask them to move on? You know, I, I thought it was a good set of questions and I, and I think much like you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do better once I see something a little bit more firm. Um, and the only thing I didn't see on risk assessments here, but it's, 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 it's in, I know it's in here is just, uh, you get a business that's had like 12 data breaches, you might want to look at it differently, you know, so the, the frequency, but I, I know you're talking about some of the stuff talks about it here. So, yeah. Um, maybe we should then move on to the next slide. Uh, thank you. So what you will see in the set of questions that relate to cybersecurity audits is that they overlap a little bit with the questions that relate to privacy assessments. We are thinking about how those two things might be um, integrated, how we can maybe um, reuse the criteria for uh, identifying risk in the context of privacy. Uh, for um, the triggering of the cybersecurity audit um, requirement. Um, but in at a high level, the, the um, bullet points here relate to uh, obtaining information from participants in the um, uh, comment period around existing legal requirements and compliance processes that might be in place that we might want to um, import into our rules because we deem that they are sufficient and adequate. Um, the uh, next one is um, in, in regards to other requirements, um, such as um, all these assessments, evaluations, and be best practices and compliance processes. So it might not be something that is required by law, but there is a possibility that there could be best practices in place that we want to consider while we draft our requirements for cybersecurity audits. Um, and the last one relates to the uh, acceptance of. Um, cybersecurity audit assessments or evaluations. So it's very um, similar to what I mentioned before. We seek public input on whether the agency should accept cybersecurity audit assessments or evaluations completed to comply with other laws or for other purposes, and how businesses could demonstrate to the agency that those audit assessments or evaluations comply with our requirements. Again, I'm gonna pause here and gonna give an opportunity to um, other board members to provide comments. But the idea um, really for this um, presentation was to uh, provide advice on the fact that we think that we should reopen for um, uh, um, comment period and give you some preview of what's coming and um, give you the time that you might need to provide input. Thank you. Um, I don't have anything further. Um, okay, if there's if there's nothing, we can move on to the next next slide. 
Um, and yeah, and automated decision making, you know, the questions, um, you know, there, there's a couple different categories, but generally, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out what other existing legal requirements or compliance processes, um, you know, we've gotten comments from many uh, members of the public saying, you know, there's these certain regulations already out there that cover some of what uh, California is asking for in the statute. So we're trying to get a bigger picture of, you know, where the where there's alignment, where we can harmonize with existing rules, um, and where we need to build on top of existing rules. So, um, you know, there's questions around that. Um, you know, we have questions around algorithmic discrimination, um, particularly questions four and five from the automated decision making section, um, and. That will help, you know, questions and answers to this will help us determine um, how, to, how to design the access and opt-out rights to address uh, algorithmic discrimination and help us refine those rules. Um, you know, we have questions around different sectors. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we, we had folks from different sectors say, you know, that we have, they have certain rules that are already applicable to them. So how do we designed for that. And also, you know, access and opt-out rights may have different, maybe, you know, you, you might want your opt-out right in certain situations, and we need to build that into the regulations, you know, particularly when there's maybe high-risk decisions being made, um, or you want more access rights when it's a, a banking decision or, a, you know, other types of decisions. So just trying to understand how to calibrate um, these these access and opt out rights um, in the statute and in the regulations in a way that works across different sectors, different contexts. Um, and then finally, you know, more specificity regarding meaningful information um, about the logic involved in automated decision making. I think we got a lot of good high level comments. Um, and I think we at the subcommittee could could benefit from understanding, you know, in a context specific way, does what is meaningful uh, change, right? So you may want different information depending on the type of decision being made about you. So if it's a relatively low stakes one, perhaps uh, there can be different, um, you know, what, what is meaningful isn't as, uh, it doesn't have to be as expansive. So um, just help and comments to help calibrate around that. So those are generally the ideas behind um, why we're asking these questions. Um, I think the the you know ultimate regulations would really benefit from uh, further refinement and feedback from the public, which is why we're bringing this back for um, another round of preliminary rulemaking. I think uh, I speak for the subcommittee when um, I want to thank uh, Mr. Soltani and all the staff that we've gotten. Uh, over the past couple months, I think we've we've definitely seen all the the benefits of the new hiring. Uh, we have a lot more staff to answer the questions that we have to help us develop the regulations. So we're able to move a lot faster than we were in the past uh, when when the agency was, you know, much smaller. Uh, and so, thank you, Mr. Soltani. Thank you to all the folks that have been helping out our subcommittee. I just wanted to take a second to uh, echo that. Um... Uh, statement. We've, we've been um, supported tremendously for this presentation. The staff is really working on coming up with uh, thoughtful requirements in an area that is complicated. And um, I know we can name them here, but they know who they are. <laughs> I mean, it really everybody at the agency, and in particularly Mr. Sultani, for the support of his subcommittee. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. <clears throat> Um, are, you, are you open for suggestions from Mr. McTaggart and me now again? Um, good. I do have some overarching thoughts, just on specific things. Um, Mr. McTaggart, please go ahead. Yeah, you're, I don't have any uh, overarching suggestions. I just want to say thank you for uh, this really excellent work. I thought these questions were super comprehensive. I know a lot of people put them together. And I, you know, what excites me about these areas is they're so fundamental to the future of, of privacy in this country. And in many respects, this is one in eight Americans. These will become the standards uh, that, uh, you know, other people will want to, you know, adhere to. So I think we need to, much like CARB, you know, with the air quality stuff, I think this is a, this is a, the, the, the level we should hold ourselves to is, is sort of a, uh, that kind of level of standard of, of being able to be uh, something that anywhere in the country can rely on it. And, and um, it's so fundamental to uh, 
getting our as citizens kind of power balance back with respect to these algorithms, which determine so much of how we live our lives, uh, that I'm really excited to see this work go ahead. And I, I, I just want to thank you for your hard work on this. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. So my overarching um, suggestions, I think, are almost certainly incorporated in your thinking, um, but I will offer them just in case they are helpful. Uh, the first is uh, Mr. McTaggart's comment with regards to the first topic. Um, I would encourage you to apply to all of them, thinking through. And, it, you know, for example, with the last topic, Mr. Lay, it was really clear that is how you're thinking, calibrating um, requirements and calibrating information forcing mechanisms as fits the situation. Um, so I appreciate that. And just that was kind of something that I thought was an is an overarching um, goal that I hope um, you are considering and staff will consider. Um, the second is very obvious. Um, I will say it um, anyway, um, just in order to have it um, have it be um, expressed explicitly, which is that Ms. Delatory mentioned that these are very complex. They are very complex. Um, one of the ways in which this particular regulatory package is going to be especially complex is its conversation with a really rapidly developing technological business and social landscape. Um, I heartily agree with Mr. McTaggart that we are at a point in society's relationship with these algorithms that requires some kind of intervention. And our job is going to be to calibrate as well as we can to provide um, clear and helpful guidance, um, solid rights for consumers, and not over-engineer or over-specify the thing so much that it's out of date very quickly. Um, so, and I realized that, you know, that is everyone knows this about this area of law and with regards to algorithmic decision-making. Um, I just think it's a particularly pointed challenge for this particular um, potential regulatory package. And so in terms of thinking through questions for the public, um, I would value asking some pretty specific questions um, that try to get at um, some of that, you know, example, you were asking for examples, which is great. There are examples out there. Um, but if um, both businesses and consumers have specific examples they can give us to work with um, of how they're using algorithms, how algorithms are being deployed, how they've encountered them in ways that, that worry them, hopefully that could go into a framework that is provides good, solid guidance to businesses, good, solid rights to consumers lasts um, as long as it can and doesn't overdetermine things so as to leave some things out. Um, and that, of course, is the beauty of regulation. You know, we have a statute that gives us a lot of clear guidance. Our job with the regulation is to sort of put flesh on the bones of the statute and to provide guidance that then can be updated um, more frequently than a statute, but still, you know, we'd like it to um, be helpful. Um, uh, for a sufficient amount of time. And I know that's just kind of one of the central challenges of this job, but I thought that I would, I thought that I would mention it because there may be things to work in to the questions um, that would be helpful. Um, I also want to um, just echo Mr. McTaggart's eloquent thanks to both of you, to Mr. Sultani, to other experts on the staff, and to all of the experts who joined us um, for our information session back in the spring for all of the input um, into this. I think the work is um, shows that quality and shows that effort, and it's very much appreciated. Yeah, I, I just want to thank you for uh, for that input. And you know, your your points are well taken. You know, definitely is a consideration for us is like how do we create a framework that can evolve and doesn't require a new rulemaking every time technology evolves as well, um, while also you know providing enough guidance for businesses to understand um, how to implement those regulations. So uh, yeah, balancing those two is definitely a big consideration for um, yeah, our subcommittee. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sultani? I just wanted to thank um, the subcommittee for their 
expertise and input both on kind of the issues at stake as well as the compatibility and harmonization. And I want to especially thank um, Mr. Laird and the legal team for really switch hitting uh, and supporting this work without uh, kind of interfering and slowing down the existing regulatory package, which is effectively mean they just work twice as much instead of uh, just by, so I really appreciate that team. I don't think we need to name them, but they know who they are. They, they've been working really hard to support both subcommittees or this subcommittee and uh, the package. So I'm really thankful for the staff, um, the amount of work they put in so far. Um, so thank, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Um, with that um, discussion, may I have a motion to, and also I will ask Mr. Lay and Ms. De La Torre when I finish this to let me know if this sounds right, this is what I've taken from the conversation in your materials. May I have a motion to direct staff to prepare a set of rule, new rulemaking topics and questions for public comment based on guidance provided by the new CPRA rules subcommittee during today's agenda item and presentation and incorporating any additional guidance from today's board discussion to be approved by the board at a future meeting. Does that sound uh, right? Right. I, to be honest, we, we were not expecting to lead this to a motion, but if you feel that it is appropriate to, to do a motion, we are happy to to do a motion. Um, I simply was trying to construct what you might need based on your material. <laughs> I, I would ask um, uh, Mr. Laird if, if that's necessary. Um, I, I'm a little unclear myself if, if we need okay. that. The one, the one thing that I think could be helpful um, is if board members are providing input to staff is that we have a clear demarcation of information that is within the subcommittee and information that is in the hands of staff so that board members can provide input to staff without any question of us having backroom conversations amongst ourselves that don't comply with Bagley Keen, which isn't the intention. Um, but if we have a clear demarcation of what that material is, um, it I think helps um, in terms of record keeping. Um, I just wanted to reassure you that we, you know, Mr. Lear has helped us and Mr. Sultani has a very good awareness of the processes and requirements. So we're very confident that uh, once we finish our work and we provide the um, draft to them, they will follow the processes that need to be followed to ensure that there are no um, cross wires. Um, but um, Mr. Mr. Lear, uh, if you could instruct us as to whether we should take a motion or maybe we don't need it, um, it would be really helpful. Uh, absolutely. And first off, I just want to thank this board per usual for actually caring and paying attention to the Bagley Keene Opening Meeting Act. It makes my job a lot easier. Um, but I agree with what's been stated and um, staff is making every effort to ensure that there's no violations and that, you know, streams are kept separate as discussed. Um, in terms of the need for a motion, um, frankly, this is the type of uh, this discussion has been closely followed by staff, and um, we, I think, can take the direction given today since essentially um, the deliverable, as far as I, I see it, is to come back to this board with a final product for their consideration. We can do that without a motion. Um, if the board would prefer a motion, that's also welcome, but um, a, a motion is not strictly necessary in this instance. Uh, staff is happy to take this direction. And I'll defer to Mr. Sultani, of course, if, he, if there's any clarifications he thinks we need, but from my standpoint, I think we understand um, what's to be done from this point forward and what we will bring back to the board at the next meeting. I'll just respond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Laird. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think to address Ms. Um, Chair, Chairperson Zerbin's point, we can just perhaps just set um, uh, a, a point where we can signal to the board when uh, I, don't, I don't know if we want to basically signal to the board at what point it's transferred over to staff. So at what point the subcommittee has kind of um, uh, finished their touches and, and released it to staff. So I don't know if um, if uh, if uh, um, Lydia has her hand, hand up. So maybe maybe you have some idea. Uh, um, well, my suggestion will be if the board members will agree to just, you know, work on your thoughts around these questions, but just hold on to them until a member of the staff 
um, proactively reaches out to you for feedback. It should happen in the next uh, few weeks. And we will make sure that we work with Mr. Sultani and with Mr. Lair to ensure that there's no cross wires. And that at that point, you will be basically interacting with the staff and the staff will finalize um, the questions and bring them to, and we will bring them to the next board meeting. Thank you, Ms. Delatory. Um, if that's good for Mr. Laird, that's good for me. I think we've had quite a clear discussion. Um, Mr. Sabo, is there any public comment? Members of the public, if you'd like to make a comment on agenda item eight, at this time, please go ahead and raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone if you're joining us by phone today. So again, for agenda item nine, public, or uh, for agenda item eight, apologies, new CPRA rules subcommittee update and next steps. If you'd like to comment on that item, please raise your hand using the Zoom feature or by pressing star nine. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands raised at this time. All right, thank you, Mr. Sabo. Um, thank you again. Um, to Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay and all the staff who've helped them put this together. And we will look forward to hearing from staff. Um, and we and the public will all look forward um, to the next iteration when it comes before the board again. Um, with that, we will move to agenda item number nine, which is the item we have in most meetings in which we invite public comment on items that are not in the agenda. Before we proceed with public comment, um, please do note that all the board can do is listen to comments and consider whether it will discuss the topic at a future meeting. Though this may seem at times like board members are not being responsive, that is not our intention. Following these guidelines is critical to ensure the rules of the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act are followed and so that we don't compromise either the commenter's goals or the board's goals. With that, Mr. Sabo, I would like to open um, this up for general public comment. Okay, so again, if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. First, we have Ryan Carrier. Ryan, I'm going to um, unmute you and you'll be given three minutes uh, to make your comment and I'll let you know when your three minutes has expired. So go ahead and proceed when ready. Thank you, Chair Urban and distinguished panel members. Can you hear me okay? We can, please go ahead. Excellent. I'm the Executive Director of For Humanity, a nonprofit public charity established with a very simple mission to examine and analyze downside risk from AI algorithmic and autonomous systems and engage in risk mitigations on those systems for the maximum benefit from these tools for humanity. Our primary work is independent audit of AI systems, We've worked for 26 months with the ICO on both GDPR and uh, Children's Code certification schemes. And we are now prepared to offer to the state of California CCPA certification schemes and age appropriate design certification schemes. I would ask you to consider how to receive these schemes. In other words, is it, is it a board function? Is it an agency function? Is it the attorney general's function? Uh, this would be a new process uh, in the state of California, I imagine, as well as, as across the United States. It hasn't been enacted since 1975 when the SEC approved GAAP uh, for financial accounts and reporting. And that's what we're aiming to replicate with this infrastructure of trust through independent audit of AI systems. We have entire certification schemes available for CCPA and age-appropriate design code but we don't claim any authority and we don't seek any authority. We seek to submit these tools to you as authority for your approval. If you are interested in establishing this kind of infrastructure of trust, where independent auditors abiding by the Sarbanes-Oxley definition of independence can engage in providing assurance of governance, oversight, and accountability that match the law. And so, 
on behalf of our 1,200 members who are all volunteers from 77 countries around the world. We are providing this service uh, if you're interested because it enhances global harmonization of compliance with privacy laws, EUAI Act, for example, as well. And it allows for better assurance of compliance with the laws that you are so uh, aptly defending. And I wanna also thank you for the work that you did in support of Californians uh, as a function of the federal law that was proposed. That was a wonderful response. And I greatly appreciate the effort you put in for that. Uh, so I would ask the board to consider how to uh, approach these kind of certification schemes and how we might uh, offer them to the state of California. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Sabo, is there further public comment? I don't see any at this moment. If any other members of the public would like to speak at this time, this is agenda item nine, public comments on items not on the agenda. Please go ahead and raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining us by phone today. Again, that's the Zoom raise hand feature or by pressing star nine. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any additional speakers at this time. Thank you, Mr. Sabo. And as a reminder, the board is not able to discuss anything brought up under this agenda item other than discuss whether to put it on uh, agenda for future discussion, which will be our next um, agenda item as well. Um, Ms. De La Torre, did you want to... Um, uh... I was going to encourage the gentleman who participated to file comments when we open our preliminary um, rulemaking, but I hope that that's within the realm of what we can do under this agenda item. If, if it's not, I apologize. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to bless it, and Mr. Laird hasn't pulled us off the stage yet, but we will now move on just to be safe. <laughs> okay, um, so we will move now to item number 10, future agenda items. Um, this is an opportunity for both members of the board and members of the public to suggest items for future board meetings. Of course, we have had a robust discussion on several topics that will be slotted into future board meetings today. Um, so we do expect to devote time to budget discussions, legislative discussions, um, and confirmation of the task force members um, chosen by the executive director under items we've discussed today. We will expect um, to um, discuss again the work on the new CPRA rules that we discussed earlier today. We also have a few items that are on my list um, uh, that we will be getting to um, as soon as we can, which includes input by the board on the hiring of the deputy director of public affairs, um, I believe there's some ongoing work with um, public awareness, and um, uh, we've talked about um, various, um, to, to let staff know if there are any um, expert presentations the board would still like. Um, we now have um, some experience under our belts, but we do have new board members and probably a new board member coming soon. Um, and we will be having a discussion of a sort of structural organization for how we think about allocating work, um, including with subcommittees. And now that we are um, uh, staffed with a very competent staff um, and we are heading into a new um, stage of maturity um, and we'll have a new board member soon. So those are the items I have jotted down on my list at the moment. Um, are there further um, agenda items uh, to add to the list of consideration from board members? Mr. McTaggart. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, so, uh, you know, on the first of the two day, first day of the two day meeting we had back in whenever it was, October, um, at the end of the day meeting, I raised a number of uh, items and said, and I think a couple other board members ha had some others as well, that I requested to be the subject of future rulemaking uh, 
you know, examination by the by the by the administration. So I'd uh, just love to get an update on kind of what the time frame. I know everything's busy, so I'm not, you know, I, I get we're trying to get this first package out the door, but um, just wouldn't mind it, uh, a uh, uh, sense of when those we, I could expect something from administration. And then as I went back through the package, I realized that I had forgotten uh, to raise one item, which I kind of wanted to. So um, maybe I can hear the first. And then if it's appropriate, if I if you're uh, I can bring up the second one uh, that I'm interested in. So I'm going to ask Mr. Laird to just be sure that we are doing this correctly, but I believe that Mr. McTaggart can um, suggest a specific rulemaking topic for future board discussion under this agenda item, correct? Absolutely, yes. Okay, so we will do that in just a moment. Um, and then in terms of um, the items that came up at the end of our October 28th, 29th meeting. Um, I do know there's a, a list of those, um, Mr. McTaggart, I apologize, I didn't um, put them in my list to go through them all um, today. Um, uh, do, does um, Mr. Sultani or um, other members of staff um, have a sense of whether that is something that will be taken up when this the package that is in process is out as sort of in parallel with the topics from the new CPRA rules subcommittee, or do you have an idea of it, or um, shall we hear about that in the next meeting? The timing. That, that's a great question. We can, um, Phil. I don't know wanna, if you want to respond, but my instinct is to um, take up that timeline once we have a better sense in the new year in January uh, as to kind of uh, completion of the rules as well as the delegation and. And the question you asked earlier, Mr. McTaggart, of you know whether there can be pieces that are forked off, and so potentially the pieces that, if there are pieces that are forked off, the pieces that you have suggested to revisit, and the pieces of um, legislative uh, uh, rulemaking that we might consider as part of the new rules package, all will be part of future rulemakings. And so I think we'll need to discuss um, as a board how you all would want to prioritize and sequence them. Um, I do stress wanting to sequence them for a number of reasons, but I'm happy to do that in, in whatever um, sequence the board feels uh, appropriate. And then, and then I think to your point, um, it seems like we should talk about those, um, but I guess uh, in sequence. But there's, I guess, there's nothing preventing the board if they choose to to talk about those issues, um, you know, and and uh, kind of deliberate on those issues in advance of the the um, rules. Um, but I'll let Phil correct me. Uh, if, if, if I'm wrong about that, uh, you, you're you're not wrong about that. I was going to jump in to just add that um, uh, certainly discussions can start sort of as, as the board is ready to engage on those topics. But I would strongly encourage that we at least conclude the current rulemaking before we formally start any additional rulemaking to, especially involving amendments of those regulations currently under consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Lard. Okay, Mr. McTaggart, I will. Um, I will go to Ms. Delatory in a second, but I know you said you thought of something else that you wanted to add to the list. So please add it. Sure. Um, so it's it's right back in the weeds here, but it's it's with proposed regulation 7050 uh, A4. And so this was service providers, contractors, third parties. And this is um Uh, an exception to allow them to retain, use, or disclose information, except for a couple of things. And as I, I'd forgotten to bring this up, uh, A4, the, the new language allows the service provider to not, you know, to, to not delete or whatever, to keep on using in order to prevent, detect, or investigate data security incidents. And this reminds me of something that happened in 2019 when CCPA was, was, um, Kind of before CPRA passed, with CCPA was under threat uh, in the legislature, and I'm I'm very concerned about the breadth, uh, Mr. Sultani, of that language, because I could, if I were a, you know, malintentioned actor, say, well, I'm always going to keep your information. I'm never going to delete it because I am going to prevent some future problem that I don't even have right now. And I, I think if you recall, Mr. Sultani, we went through that with. Uh, was A B something, a fourteen something? It was a a a, a bill that was. Um, Pending and and so I I think it's um, I, I understand think the intention. I do want to pause and just check in. Like I've captured the item, I think, 
but I think we can't discuss the substance of it, although you're welcome to talk about it with staff. Okay. I, I, all right. Um, that's Is that right, Mr. Lair? I'd like to give them as much room as possible, but I also want not to go beyond what we're allowed to do. Yes, I, I would advise at this time that um, we can certainly identify specific topics for future agenda items, but I would discourage any any sort of formal discussion on the substance of them at this time. Okay, but it's sort of a question. How, if I'm bringing something up, how do I say why I'm bringing it up? I got, I got to be able to say why I'm bringing it up. Like, I, like it's hard to just bring it up in a vacuum and say, please look at these words. I have to say why I think that they're a problem. I think that you can certainly provide that input to staff. And when we do take it up um, in a future agenda item, then we'll have the discussion about why, um, why and what um, amendments are being recommended. Okay, well, anyway, that's, that's one. And then the other question I was going to have was, so if I understand you correctly, and, and, and you know this is a month, this is a huge, this 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 huge uh, uh, rule package. Obviously, it's the main one, but then in the future, I, I just would like to have more clarity on. I'm imagining, given how much things change, that there's kind of always going to be on the boil some rules, and so whether we do it at every meeting or with every other meeting, it just it feels like there 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 it would be useful to have a. I don't think kind of we're only going to update the rules once a year is going to work. Uh, so I'd love to have some kind of uh, thought around what our policy is for sort of that ongoing. You could have a rule here and, you know, uh, you don't want to take up the whole meeting every time with rules. But I do think there should be a process for uh, kind of a regular update to rules. One second, I'm just making sure I, I get this down. So um, I heard possibly, Mr. McTaggart, two parts to that, and I just want to be sure I have it right. Um, one is um, one is um, making sure there are regular updates for clarity um, as to what's in process, what's on the boil. And the second part is um, a process so that we all have a good understanding of how um, updates to regulations will be coming before the board um, in a more general sense. So there were two parts. There was a there was a updates part and a, a process part. Yeah. I think you're doing a better job at explaining what I said than I did. I think all I had simply said was there should be a regular process for making the rule up, you know, changing rules. But I think you're bringing up a good good second part of that, which is that we should be updated about how things are going up along as well. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, Ms. De La Torre. Thank you, Chair Urban. Um, so I also have uh, two items. One, I think it really overlaps with the conversation that you were just having, and it's about uh, learning better how a board member that's not part of the subcommittee that proposed rules can engage with the agency in terms of improving on um, any particular rule. This relates to um, in my case, to rule um, 7002, I was hoping to have an opportunity to work with the staff um, in between meetings to propose an improved version. Uh, and, and we just, um, you know, there's a, a little bit of lack of clarity as to what were the wishes of the board when we had that conversation. So if we could bring um, an item uh, in the next meeting, about how can we engage with the agency in terms of um, improving on any particular rule and what kind of support in terms of um, support from staff we should um, get as individual board members. That would be really helpful. The other one is really clear and simple, but I'm gonna pause here. I know that you need to summarize it. I, I just wanna give you time to make sure that you have that and, and ask questions see if there are questions. Thank you, Ms. Lesway, I think I have it. Um, you were asking for this, I read as a kind of a combination of the process and some of that background information that we have been receiving um, periodically. Um, learning more about how a board member who's not a member of a subcommittee considering a specific part of a regulation um, will be able to provide input on part of that part of the regulation um, that the board members not on the subcommittee for. You gave the example of 702 of the current proposed rulemaking. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so what we are looking for is some understanding of the options 
and how, um, and then a process for how board members can engage with agency, um, with the agency and get support. So I think that was pretty clear. And then yeah, uh, your second uh, item. So the second item is very um, short. It's um, the one of the consequences of Mr. Thomas stepping down from the board is that one of the subcommittees I'm a member of, the process of committee right now only has one member. And so I believe that we should bring up to the board the idea of appointing a new member for the process of committee in our next meeting so that that subcommittee can complete its um, mandate. Thank you, Ms. De La Troy. Um, having lost my subcommittee member as well um, earlier, um, it's actually a little more complicated in practice, um, but the request is very simple as promised, and that is already um, on my list um, as the sort of part of the discussion of, of subcommittees. So thank you for that. Um, Mr. Sultani? If it's okay, I just wanted to capture um, uh, separate from Ms. Delatore's comment, um, the combination of Ms. Delatore's first comment and Mr. McTaggart's first comment. So Mr. McTaggart had a question on 7050A4, uh, um, the exception for service providers. And so I, I've captured that. And then if I understood that correctly, we were, we're effectively, and this it kind of um, reminds me of Ms. Um, Mahoney's presentation on the process for when um, the board will receive an update on rules. The board will um, uh, the process for board members to propose rules, as well as staff to propose you know changes we might recommend, and then a, a, another kind of as a process for prioritizing which of those then we first take up and allocate resources to. So I kind of see that um, as one kind of um, bucket similar to what Ms. Mahoney laid out in these regular intervals where there will be opportunity over the year as well as regular check-ins. Um, do I have that right? Is that what the board's kind of asking? I believe for? that was I believe that was a little bit of substance on what it might look like. Um, uh, Executive Director Sultani, but I think those are components of requests that we yeah. have had for discussion in future board meetings okay. from, from, from board members, yes. We've embroidered on Mr. McTaggart's um, statement a little bit, but I'm sure he'll object if we've embroidered too much. And I apologize for my earlier embroidery. Okay, are there further um, uh, suggested future agenda items from board members? All right, um, Mr. Um, Sabo, are there any suggested future agenda items from members of the public? I don't see any hands raised at this time. If you'd like to make a suggestion per the chair's direction, please go ahead and raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand function or pressing star nine on your phone. This is for agenda item number 10, future agenda items. Again, if you'd like to recommend something to the board, please go ahead and raise your hand. I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Thank you, Mr. Sabo. Uh, and thank you uh, to the board um, and to the public for the helpful um, information in the last two agenda items. I'm going to pause here and talk a little bit about process um, because our next agenda item, which is our last substantive item on the agenda, um, is a closed session item. The board will be um, moving into closed session for discussion of the executive director's annual review under authority of government code section 11126 subdivision A um, paragraph one. So the process is that the public session here will remain open while the board is in closed session. Um, we will return to this public session but we have put um, our closed session discussion at the end of the substantive agenda. Um, so we will simply be returning to adjourn the meeting. Um, and I say this just so the public, um, members of the public who are joining us today have full information um, about our plans. Um, when we come back, we are planning um, simply to adjourn at that time. 
Um, you're welcome to stay with the public session open and we will return um, as soon as we can. Um, secondly, is there any public comment on this final agenda item before um, we go into closed session? Again, if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're dialing by phone. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. In that case, anticipating that some members of the public um, may wish um, to um, not return, I will take the opportunity now to thank the board members um, for all of their thoughtful discussion today, uh, Mr. Sabo, for his moderation so far. I know he will be mod he'll continue moderating, but I will thank him now. Um, Ms. Mahoney, um, Mr. Laird, and Mr. Sultani um, for all the work they've done for us um, that they presented to us today. Um, the new CPRA Rules Subcommittee for all of their wonderful substantive work. Um, and I'd like to wish everyone a happy holiday season full of warmth and light um, as winter holidays are meant to help us evoke. Um, and then for members of the board, um, please um, repair to the closed session Zoom link. I'd like to start at 1.30 if that's all right. Um, so that I can gather some necessary materials, and I will plan to see you all there then. Um, members of the public, we will see you when we come back to adjourn if you'd like. Otherwise, again, thank you very much, um, and we appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, board members. Let's um, move to the closed session. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, um, before the board moved to closed session, um, our final item is, is adjournment. Um, I would like to report out that the board um, took no votes um, in our closed session meeting. Um, our final agenda item is number 12, adjournment. Um, I would like to thank everyone, board members, staff, members of the public, for their contributions to the meeting and to the board's work. Um, thanks so much to everyone today. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I'll make the motion. Thank you, Mr. Lay. May I have a second? Second. I second. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, I have a motion and a second to um, approve I have a motion and a second to adjourn. Mr. Saba, would you please perform the roll call vote? Yes, the motion is to adjourn. Board Member De La Torre. Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board Member Lay. Aye. Lay, aye. Board Member McTaggart. Aye. McTaggart, aye. Chair Urban. Aye. Urban, aye. With that, the motion carries in a vote to 4-0. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. The motion has been approved by a vote of four to zero. And this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board stands adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>